Hello. 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 I am the ghost of Talkumentary. About a year ago, we started this podcast. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome strangers to Talkumentary, a show where we watch documentaries and then get together and talk about them. Documentary will find you in the end. You'll find out that we're all friends. <laughs> Don't be sad, I know you will. But don't give up until Documentary will find you in the end Hello friends, it's Jeff, the host of Documentary. This is our 46th episode, and I'm here this week Bryce is strumming the chords, and Lauren is tickling the ivories No <laughs> Over there, Bryce Necker, the friendly ghost, and my sister Lauren, the with the vile corruption, the sawed-off head of Joe the Boxer. All right, Bryce, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the first, the first ever, and probably the last ever. Nails live, on a chalkboard. Live show. <laughs> <laughs> sounded like cats No, screaming. it didn't. It sounded amazing. <laughs> and I hope everyone listening writes in and says, I don't know what Lauren was talking about mm-hmm. because that was incredible. Bryce, before we go any further into this episode, I want to get this out of the way. Go out, rate and review our podcast on your favorite podcast streaming service and let us know what you think of our show. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Just look for at Documentary Podcast, or you can shoot us an email at info.documentary at gmail.com. Yeah, exactly. See, you did it. I did it. I you have know, for the last like three episodes. You know some things. <laughs> You're not as big of an idiot as you seem. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's get into it. This week... We took a peek inside the mind of a musical and artistic man, some might call a genius, others in the room might not, but we take an up-close and personal look at some of the results of the artistic expression of none other than the seemingly pure and childlike lo-fi artist named Daniel Johnston in a 2005 documentary titled The Devil and Daniel Johnston. Here is the trailer. My name is Daniel Johnston. This is the name of my tape. It's Hi, How Are You? And I I was having a nervous breakdown when I recorded it. Try to remember but my feelings can't... And he was a skinny little kid, fairly demented, but he said, I just wanted to give you my tape. And I put it on the tape player and it just blew my mind. There's really nothing to even compare it to. It, it goes way beyond Dylan's basement recordings or any other body of work that I can think of. You start off hearing this noise, then eventually you hear the Beatles. You hear the whole symphony. But it was undeniable that something was dreadfully wrong with him. He was thin as a rail, losing weight. Was completely delusional. He was hospitalized almost immediately. He was obsessed with the devil and Satan. He became so obsessed that it was all he could talk about. This is Daniel Johnston speaking from a mental hospital. They tell me I'm crazy here. Out come the demons. Listen up and I'll tell a story. About an artist growing old. Some would try for fame and glory. Others aren't so bold. (laughs) 
All right, Bryce, man, this was yeah. your jam. Yep. You've been pushing us to cover this one since we started this show. Um, and we'll get into in a little bit why you chose this one. Um, but you love this documentary, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah? It, it, it's my favorite documentary. Of all time. Of all time. So far. So far that that we've that we've seen, or just that you've you, are you convinced that this has got it? Uh, that we've seen, you know. Okay. There's always potential for you know more. But what, what would what would take the cake? What kind of what would it have to be? What would it have to? I don't know. I, I I'll, I'll know if it happens. Though. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, you know, so I know you love this one, but I'm curious about the sister sitting over there. Um, she gave me a little bit of a um. Uh, the vibes, I think what Lauren, I wasn't familiar with Daniel Johnston at all before this, just, you know, I, I know that I'd seen the, the drawings before, whether it was on Kurt Cobain's t-shirt or on something somewhere in a record store somewhere, but I didn't know what it was. What about you? Any? No, I had no idea who this guy was. A couple words. What do you think? What did you think of this film? Um, you got two words. Two words. Uh huh. Manic anxiety. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, meaning, I meaning that you felt yes. anxious watching this. This made me very uncomfortable. Really? I did not like this at all. Okay. I struggled to get through this. I think I probably stopped it at least four times and watched mm. it in like twenty minute increments because. <laughs> Yeah. And I just finished it this morning because mm-hmm. I was like, I gotta go over the good, good thing I post <laughs> good thing I postponed the episode. Yeah, you I know. Mean, Jesus. Well and but when you when you texted saying you wanted to postpone the episode, I was watching it and I was like, Oh thank God, turn this <laughs> off. shit off. I gotta I gotta watch Labyrinth or something. Yeah, I gotta yeah. I need a palate cleanser. Yeah. Um <laughs> so this was directed by Jeff Fjurzig. Um, who won the Documentary Directing Award for this film at the 2005 Sundance Film Festival. And Bryce and I actually had the pleasure of chatting with him for an episode of what we're calling Documentary Insider. Pew, 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 pew. Um, Make sure you stick around, because at the end of this episode, um, we are actually going to play that interview that we had with Jeff Fierzig, and it was really cool. And I did like this episode before that, or I'm sorry, this documentary before talking to him, but just like most of the time, once you talk to someone involved with it, now you're even more invested. And I liked it even more after that. Um, we're also going to have it on a, a separate episode as well. Um, but if you want to just listen to it directly after this, you can just hang tight and listen. Um, so it was a very enjoyable chat with Jeff. Jeff, if you're listening to this, Thank you very much. We really enjoyed our conversation, and I'm looking forward to covering another one of your documentaries at some point. Um, my, I want to do uh, the 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 Rocky one. I don't remember what it's called. Um, the real Rocky, I think. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, produced by Henry Rosenthal, distributed by Sony Pictures Classic, and we rented, or I should say, Bryce purchased this through Amazon. Uh, the Devil and Daniel Johnston has a fresh 88% uh, on Rotten Tomatoes tomato meter with 111 views, or reviews, and an audience score of 91% with over 25,000 ratings. Here's a few of the critic reviews. A two out of four Rotten review from Richard Propes of The Independent Critic says, more of a film for Johnston's almost cult-like admirers. So I guess, um, and a fresh review from Josh Goller of Spectrum Culture says, quote, a convincing case for how the transcendence of Johnston's art stemmed from the rawness with which he expressed himself in spite of and not due to his demons, which was interesting. And a fresh review from Robert W. Butler of Kansas City Star says, quote, what makes Devil fascinating is the harrowing, harrowing, harrowing. I heard you, your head nod. <laughs> People can't see that unless they're yeah. watching. Yep. Anyway, what makes Devil fascinating is the harrowing arc of Johnston's life. This is a story of youthful promise undermined by horrendous mental illness. Anyway, we're going to have credit information. Uh, 
in the show notes. Show notes. Let's get into this one. A quick warning. If you want to see what happens in this documentary before we spoil it, this is your spoiler alert. So you can go watch it or not. Here we are. All right. Let's talk about why we chose to watch The Devil and Daniel Johnston for tonight's episode. Bryce. Oh, yeah. Hit it. Uh, we decided to watch it because it's tremendous. Why did you? Why do you? Why do you love this so much? Why does it grip you so hard? <laughs> why does it put two hands? That is around. No, <laughs> we are grip not you. talking like this. Why does it tickle your fancy? <laughs> I hate this. There's some, there's some imagery here. Yep. Yes. Uh, I don't know. It was it was one of those that I saw just years ago. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know who Daniel Johnston was before watching it. Mm-hmm. And just from the opening scene of him talking into the mirror mm-hmm. to the greatest songwriter alive today. Mm-hmm. And then just through the whole thing, like I couldn't look away. Do you think do you think it's Daniel's music that caught you? Do you think it's his uh kind of his progression of mu or 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 uh, like pushing the art- artistry through the mental illness. What do you think it is about this whole thing that captured you so much? Um, I, I think it was his kind of lo-fi take on music mm-hmm. and it kind of enlightened me to think that anyone can make music um, yeah. and that, you know, e- you don't always have to make something mm-hmm. for other people. You can just make something because you want to, Express yourself. Yeah. 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 Uh, And for someone like Daniel, it was probably easier for him to express himself through his drawings or his, or his music than it was. Yeah, for sure. Vocally. I mean, um, how many times would you say that you've seen this? Do you think? Uh, Probably 10 times. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All the way through front to finish. Yeah. Or yeah. Front to finish. That's not all right. I kind of. Lauren, how many times are you going to watch this in your life? I will probably never watch this again. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, I. What about expectations, predictions? Lauren, I said Dev, Devil and Daniel Johnston. I, you said... I was excited. It says yeah. Devil in it. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, like I have it. another one for you yeah. coming up called The Devil on Trial. Yep. And I think that's going to be a little bit more up your alley. Yes. You're not on that, Bryce. So, uh, but um, anyway, so... Thoughts, predictions? I didn't watching. know anything about him. Yeah. I just thought maybe I don't I don't have any idea. Yeah. I didn't have really have any but I definitely did not get anything that I expect. Like I did not expect what I got mm-hmm. at all. <laughs> what what do you think about this film? Why were you so anxious watching it? Why did it make you feel so uncomfortable? He was just I don't know. I I mean, I think it was just the manicness behind what he was doing, mm-hmm. and it because a lot of it was it was shot really well, mm-hmm. like the film itself. Yeah, you can't great. you can't really say the, much about that because it was right. it, it was, was great. Yeah, and it was and and the amount of footage was incredible. It was an incredible story. It yeah. was. Mm-hmm. It was. It was his presence that made me uncomfortable. Something mm. about like the manicness of it made me, I had a pit in my stomach the mm-hmm. whole time trying to watch it. I think that's, here's something funny. That's how I felt when I watched Grey Gardens. And really? you And you loved, I loved Grey Gardens. That. I loved I, I really did. I felt like the whole time I had a pit in my stomach when I watched that one because they were always talking over each other mm-hmm. and they were, you know, it was all, I didn't know what was happening, mm-hmm. you know. And to me, that wasn't, an enjoyable like when it comes to filmmaking sure, yeah. it was just a home video where this one you know a lot of work a lot of production mm-hmm. went into and and after talking to Jeff Furzig it was uh you know a lot of DIY production mm-hmm. you know he literally went through and listened to every one of those tapes every word and made notes and made you know so the mm-hmm. the undertaking of boxes and boxes and boxes full of art and and music and spoken word and right. you know just recording your inner thoughts and all that you have to go through that and you have to create a story from it so that 
was really good to me. And I think that's part of the reason I liked this one so much. Yeah. And I appreciate that sure. part of it too. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I'm not here to just shit all of this documentary. <laughs> right, right. <clears throat> that's not, that's yeah. not at all. It, I can appreciate like what went into making this. Sure. And all of the footage was amazing. Like mm -hmm. it, you know, the story itself was amazing. It just, there's something, there was just something about yeah. it that I just could not get past. And it was just really difficult for me to push through. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I get that. Mm -hmm. And and I do, I do see that because a lot of times I think with, um, you know, when you're looking at something that's a little lower fi and a little less polished, and then you have somebody that's the main character mm -hmm. and they clearly are struggling with their mental health. And I think a big part, I, I too felt uncomfortable on some parts, but I think that was kind of the intention for certain parts, probably not for the whole, <laughs> but you know, like listening to the, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but listening to the way like his, his mom and dad mm. originally addressed his illness and, you know, like, and him trying to, to, be a normal person and express himself in a in a world that isn't maybe as prepared for somebody or or knows exactly how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I had no idea what to expect going into this one. Um, I wouldn't have been able to pick a Daniel Johnston uh, song out of a lineup if you had asked me to. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know his story. Um, and truthfully, the music in itself is really not my thing. Um, I don't really care for the super lo-fi, lo um, like I don't, I don't need things to be highly polished, but this sort of, the sort of indie, like, you know, there was a point in time where, you know, in the early two thousands, every, you know, indie, uh, um, little hipster band wanted to sound like Daniel Johnston. Mm -hmm. So have your guitar a little bit out of tune and bang on the piano and sing kind of strange. You're also a rich kid from, you know, whatever. So, yeah. so it's not, it's not the doing the same thing, but, um, so not really my thing, but I really liked the story. I thought it was a super captivating. Um, it was interesting. It was compelling to me. And I think it was told very well. Um, so a few details, the devil and Daniel Johnston chronicles Johnston's life from childhood up to the present, as of the um, making of the film, with an emphasis on his experiences with bipolar disorder and how it manifested itself in demonic self-obsession. We get to look at a ton of cassettes, drawings, videos, and a bunch of small doodles and sketches all over the place that Daniel created throughout uh, the years, <laughs> <laughs> which really gives an interesting look into mental illness, I thought, um, and how that coincides with art. And the making of art and the struggles that a person dealing with these sort of internal demons uh, can have just living in the society that we've created. Um, we'll get into standouts here. And what seemed to stand out the most to me was just the unending amount of creativity that came out of Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems so effortless. And in the world of you know, Instagram reels and things like that. There's a couple, uh, I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but there's a couple profiles that I follow. There's one where uh, this, this young man, his parents, he's become kind of a hit where his parents will give him a, a card and he, they say, you know, draw something and he draws it and it's like so effortless and it's fucking perfect simple like it's a real simple you know good I know exactly who you're talking yeah about. yeah and i follow him too yeah they'll say like two things and he puts them together yeah, yeah. Oh, like yeah. effortlessly you yeah. know and that's kind of what when you're dealing with like a mental illness but sometimes you know it almost feels like that amount of creativity is dampened when mm -hmm. you have a neurotypical brain you know because you don't or when you i guess just don't struggle with that sort of illness that Daniel struggled with. Do we think that if, if we were able to unapologetically let go of social norms and societal kind of constraints, I guess, would that create kind of a flow that would that sort of creative flow, I guess, be more attainable to, I think so. 
I, yeah, I think so. That's, yeah. Why? Like, are, are we stopping ourselves from doing that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, when it comes to creating things, we have how other people view it in mind, mm -hmm. um, rather than just creating it to create. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. And I also think that like it, when even when they talk about like, you know, when people hit a certain age, mm -hmm. you know, because because I feel like some people with um, I don't know what the right word is, if it's neuro. Yeah. So, or whatever. Any kind of, of mental <clears throat> like. Right. Yeah. Um, they kind of have they keep more of that childlike. Yeah. Mentality. Sure. Where their imagination doesn't ever get muted by mm -hmm. whatever else the the social norms you know going yeah. to work or you know being growing up or being stresses mature of, or you know stresses of paying bills right. or, or having well and you hear you're, you're like supposed grow to, up you know you're rub supposed some to dirt get a job on it and keep yeah. going type of a thing when you've got that child like not that uh, not that everyone with a mental illness has a child like mine but right more of a un tethered yeah mind. well and that's what it looked like we were seeing and right. and he was getting pressure to grow mm -hmm. up and get a job and mm -hmm. you know do all those things but he just kind of couldn't mm -hmm. i mean i mean that was, i think that was mm -hmm. even the words that that jeff fierzik who became very close with him even used uh not to hopefully not to misquote but but even saying like he could not express himself the way other people could mm -hmm. you know physically he could not do it Mentally, he could not do it. So he had to do things like, like this. Um, I thought it was really, well, that's going into another standout moment. Let me, let me stop there. Bryce, <laughs> yeah. standouts for you, man. What, what do you want to talk? What, what makes you excited about this one that you want to, you want to talk about first? Um, I, I think one thing that stood out to me a lot is his relationship with his family. Mm -hmm. He comes from a somewhat large family and, yep. uh, religious background and mm -hmm. yet he being the youngest um is on kind of a different trajectory than yeah. his brothers and sisters and just drives his parents crazy absolutely <laughs> crazy yeah um so they you know like you said he grew up in like a fundamentalist christian family and very traditional right wing clearly not understanding or or appreciating the art he was doing, but more importantly, it's not, not really about the art, more importantly, not understanding his mental illness. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, that was the, the real story of, of this was, was not that he was, you know, a, a quote unquote genius musician and artist, because, uh, you know, if, if you were to ask me what makes it a, a genius artist or what, you know, I have friends that I consider to be, you know, far and away a, quote unquote, better artist than Daniel Johnston or better musician than Daniel Johnston, but it's a different ball game. It's a different, mm -hmm. you know, so, so his story is teaming his demons with that, the devil and Daniel Johnston, you know, his inner demons that eventually he attributed to being actual demons, you know, in, in a struggle with Satan, mm -hmm. probably, you know, if you're going into this psychological, that probably because he was classically con conditioned to believe that there was a devil and a God and, mm -hmm. you know, and them not understanding that his family, you know, his mom would chastise him like crazy, which, you know, I, I do like that at one point, the one of the guys was like, but it wasn't without provocation. Yeah. You know, he, he was getting ridiculed, but he kind of wanted things to be on tape too. And he wanted to record them. I actually do have, um, some audio here from his mom giving him what for. Oh, cared about was making art and being John Lennon and his parents rules were in the way of that. All he wanted them to do was just keep the lights on, keep the power on so he could draw. Dan was getting to be a problem. He wanted to do everything, but he didn't want to do any of his chores, like help mow the lawn, wash the car, or any of those things. And I thought he was lacking in training. I had to settle that. <laughs> I 
every bit of the of the supposed persecution that you that, that Daniel portrays in early music was there. But um, but it, but I'm not saying it was without provocation. <laughs> he did it. He brought it on himself. He he would cause it to tape record, <laughs> to film. <laughs> many many times, Mabel would open the basement stairs door, and she used to call him an unprofitable servant. You're an unprofitable servant of the Lord. You need to leave the house and get a job. And he turned it. He used to call himself an unserviceable prophet. <laughs> I really yep. didn't like it when he put he taped me giving him what for <laughs> what for <laughs> I didn't think he would do that. He she would really harangue him, and uh, and he for? he um <laughs> it was hard on him. It was, but he's this sort of like coal burning in the basement, you know, and it's heating up the whole house, and they're just going insane from it. So the whole place is just going wild because he he it's just such a problem. Calling someone a a coal burning in the basement and heating up the whole house is such a good way and profound way and accurate way to describe somebody who's causing trouble or causing stress in a household. You know, whether you have a kid who's, you know, like you can't just ignore the fire that's burning in the basement because it's mm -hmm. heating up the whole house. I really, I really appreciated uh, that guy saying that. Um, and I, can I just say that his mom's sort of like <sighs> smile when she was talking about how she was back there kind of gave me the heeb jeebs. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I don't really like that he did that. I would give him what for? And she's kind of <laughs> smiling. I'm like, oh, why does this make me so uncomfortable? I don't, I didn't care for, well, I, I didn't know his mother, but I was like, oh, whenever she got on it, for some reason made my skin crawl. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure why. I feel like she reminded me of someone and I can't. I yeah. Can't, I told you, I yeah. can't put my finger on <laughs> who it is. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Anything else uh, about about his family that we want? So the the films were funny. Yeah, the yeah. films he made of his mom, like mm -hmm. yeah, not he, completely inaccurate, I he, guess. He would play himself, and then he would play his mom yeah. yelling mm -hmm. at him. That and was funny. Yeah, it's he had an easy way of getting new writing material with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he just played the tape over the top of it, so yeah. it was actual like. Uh, actual audio from what she was saying so it's yeah. pretty cool <laughs> as a, a big part of his super eight movies uh -huh. and then also into his music yeah <laughs> yep um lauren yeah. standouts um one standout for me was this lori chick lori his muse um <laughs> I liked how he said there was one quote that he said she inspired a thousand songs and then I knew I was an artist and I thought that was really sweet. Yeah. Even though it's a little borderline obsessive, I felt like she was a good sport about it. Yeah. And uh well it seemed like most of the the women in his life were pretty good sports yeah, about I his agree. obsession. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um they must have seen and I I I don't mean to cut you That's off okay, completely but it. like they must have seen something in him that was truly innocent maybe because I, I, go ahead yeah uh it's like kathy mccarthy mm -hmm. um said there was something so angelic about him yeah and and then the more like they hung out she was like no there's some, no, there's something, something really deeply wrong. troubling yeah. right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah because like the the and maybe it's just a way to respectfully show them in the film i don't know but when we talked to to Jeff Furzig, it didn't sound like he really filtered a whole lot of what was going on. He made it sound like that was really the, the story that you're seeing is really the story that was there. Yeah. And so, you know, that I do I too find that interesting. Like there's a good chance that if 
Daniel Johnston was young Daniel Johnston today, he could be written off as a creep. Oh, yeah. A thousand percent. And maybe viewed as a threat. And I'm not going to say that nobody viewed him that way back then necessarily, but from what we saw in the film, that wasn't the case. And I hope, <laughs> you know, and but, you know, he clearly, from what we know of, was a fairly innocent dude besides the, the things that he did when he had his mental breaks, which we'll get into in a mm-hmm. little bit. But go ahead, Lauren. Um, I just thought it was kind of cool that, like he, I think it wrote something else da- down about it. Um, gosh, where'd it go? Sorry. Um, but I just thought it was cool. He needed. I was. I also thought the part where when they, when they were talking about like how when she got a or when he found out that she had a boyfriend, it almost mm-hmm. fueled that like museness of her because then he's pining for her like oh she's gone and it never stopped his entire life like he you know there was times when he like ran into her at that mortuary or whatever like it it just she was amused from the beginning and and was amused all the way through his life Mm -hmm. which was insane to me like so it's the same person yes and it's so close to being Inappropriate. Yeah. Because it so easily could have crossed that line. Right. And my hope is that it never did. I hope so too, but it more like, well, the 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 documentary made it seem like he kind of was in on the Yeah. On the on the the prospect that she was just amused. Like that's right. what he needed to be able to When write. you say something like she caused a thousand songs. Right. And, you know, she was the 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 reason for a lot of my creativity, right. then it's like you do understand then, you know, he's not completely unaware of what's happening in the world. He's not right. completely shut off to what people are doing around him and what's happening around him. You know, I think it's easy, even for myself, I'm calling my my own self on this, to, to think of Daniel Johnston as somebody who, you know, has no idea what's going around and he's stuck in his little world, where mm-hmm. I do think that was a lot of his time spent Mm -hmm. in his own little world, but that doesn't mean he wasn't aware of what was happening. And, and like, to your point, understanding like that heartbreak, it's given me a lot of fuel for things to draw and write, Right, (laughs) right. you know? So, uh, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah. I don't know. That part just kind of stood out for me. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, like the very first thing that, and you guys kind of touched on this earlier, but the very first thing that I wrote down about this was that there are people on this earth who would kill for the amount of passion that this man has. Like the amount of Mm -hmm. fire burning within him that needs to like be let out (laughs) in creative ways is like, if you could bottle that and sell it, Mm -hmm. you would be a billionaire right people have been trying (laughs) forever yeah um the you know the my phone's buzzing you can cut this out man or you can just like you look like mr magoo (laughs) um i thought it was really crazy how daniel so this this played out like a Hollywood movie, right? In in a lot of ways, the story from beginning to end, you know, the journey that he went on. But he was both the hero and the villain. He was both the protagonist and the antagonist. Um, and he attributed the villain to being the devil, but somehow he still uh, wrote music that was seemingly pure, you know. I didn't. I haven't been through his whole catalog. It's a long ass catalog, but well, it's a lot there. But the for somebody who claimed to be as at war and Bryce, you maybe have listened to more of his music than than I have. I would imagine for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does he have songs that aren't just about love and hope? Does he have songs that are about you know? Yeah. Um, the the devils that are inside of him? Because for someone who claimed to be at war with Satan so much, I was I was a little taken back by how much of his stuff was about love and hope. Yeah. I, I think when he would sit down to, like, 
make these songs and stuff that he would kind of focus on love and hope and mm-hmm. all that. But there are a lot of songs he writes about uh, dealing with his manic depression and, mm-hmm. um, but he does it in such a way that, that it's still like hopeful and mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> it's not like dark and brooding music. It's mm-hmm. Daniel Johnston. Right. It's really kind of an interesting, this whole thing is an interesting story to me and it's so complex in my mind. And I think maybe, maybe it speaks to a little bit about what Lauren was saying with feeling a little anxious watching this because I found that I'm actually struggling tonight. And, you know, when I was writing my notes and things to figure out how to talk about this, Mm -hmm. um, that does it any justice that does it, you know, respectfully that, that, that does it, um, and, and kind of is able to encapsulate the story the right way, you know, yeah. like you have to just watch it there's, and you have to appreciate it. It's hard to pick it apart, mm-hmm. but there's also a lot to talk about. There's so much, you know? <laughs> it, yeah. There's a lot packed into the hour and 50 minutes or whatever it was that we, that we watched. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like no matter what we do, it's going to leave out some important aspects of this man's story. Mm -hmm. But um, whether you enjoy his music or not, whether you connect with his art or not, his story is compelling. And um, there's really no better way than just watching it. So go out and watch this if you're Mm -hmm. listening and you're going, what the fuck are these people talking about? (laughs) Um, Something else that stood out to me was how extreme his mental breaks were. So they mentioned that he would, you know, in one of the more kind of heart wrenching parts of the film, Mm -hmm. when his dad was crying, talking about, uh, he would give Daniel the medicine, but Daniel wouldn't take the medicine secretly. And Mm -hmm. that goes to show you how aware Daniel really was that his mental illness was fueling his Mm -hmm. artistry. Yeah. Because I know that if if I felt like if I got on a on a medicine that that I felt like completely took away all of my creativity and my creativity was what was was my thing, you know, was my was my what you live for. What I live for. I mean, because that is what you right. lived for. <laughs> yeah. And you know to to think that like and he even mentioned at one spot like I just feel numb. Like I don't have mm-hmm. anything. So he would be like a couple days, excuse me, before his concerts, he would stop taking his medication so that he'd have that creative flow, that energy, that, that spark. you know, that spark. Mm-hmm. More lively show. More lively show. Yeah. And, but <laughs> that comes with a risk because yeah, yeah. then you go into mental breaks. And the two parts that stood out the most to me were the plane crash and the lady who jumped from the window. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, those those are obviously very dangerous. We're lucky, he's lucky that nobody died from those things. Yeah. Um, but people got hurt, things got hurt. Um, I'm gonna play the plane crash scene here. Um, I didn't put the plane crash crash and the window scene. I just picked one because I didn't want to put two uh yeah. you know, things. But uh here's here's this real quick. Uh let's see. There we go. In America. On the flight. <clears throat> no, he thought he was Casper. He was reading a Casper comic book. There's a picture on the front of the book of Casper in a parachute. And Dan decided, uh, let's let's bail out. Let's jump out. And I said, no, we can't do that. We don't have any parachutes. So his mind was gone. Eventually, he took the key out turned the engine off through the key out the window. How did you recover the flight? Well, he grabbed the controls, took the plane away from me. I, he's stronger than me. We were finally going straight up and then straight down. But he finally let go in time for me to get it out of this bin. Nothing down there but trees. <clears throat> but I had training on ditching in trees, so I didn't stall it. I flew it into the trees. We ain't two big ones. <laughs> and we got out safe. But the plane was total loss. The family came and got us. 
got me. We put him in the hospital and left him there for five months. There's Dan. He's had a good time because he thought that was great. He's coming down in a spin. He was all mixed up. He felt like he did something good and he wanted us to be proud of him. There's Dan being rolled in to the emergency room. They passed a Church of Christ and to Bill and Dick's amazement, this sign was on the Church of Christ bulletin board out front. God promises a safe landing, but not a calm voyage. So the the scene right before that, his uh, dad was talking about the um, when he was given uh, Daniel's medicine and he was throwing it away and he was just sobbing and the yeah. way his dad cried and the, something about seeing a grown man cry is really difficult for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can tell his family loved him a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were willing to do what they needed to do. You know, he lived with them until his parents were, were gone. And, um, I think Jeff Fierzig said that his, uh, that his brother, brother kind of yeah. took over as his caretaker after yeah. that. Um, Mental health help and assistance had and still does have a long way to go. And I I believe that his family just wasn't knowledgeable and equipped to to know how to handle him in the ways that he really needed. You know, to take him into that plane might not have been the smartest thing in, in the world. Now, how would you have known that someone wasn't taking their meds and they weren't, you know, I, I don't know. And there's, there's no judgment here. You know, it's just a hmm, you know you you your heart breaks when things you hear about things like that um the other story like i mentioned was when daniel uh believing that an elderly woman was possessed by satan he broke into her apartment causing the woman to jump from her second floor apartment window and break her legs um, she had told him to shut up out of her window because I think he was like shouting out and yelling. Yeah, he was out in the street making yeah. noise. She said, shut up. And uh, he went up there. Eventually, he got the door open and I think he had a knife. Was uh, that, did I, that, do I remember that right? There, there was, I don't think there was a mention of a knife, okay. but whatever he said or however he was acting was enough to scare her into jumping out of her mm. second story window. Um, yeah, and, yeah, this is an elderly woman. Um, yeah. And, uh, when, when he was talking to the police after that, they got a quote from him. Um, I cast out this lady's demons. Mm. <laughs> um, and then it's like, so did you throw her out the window? The demons threw her out the window. Yeah. Right. And he was like, I, I had left already. They, and the demons threw her out. Right. And <laughs> I, I, I truly believe that, that he believed that. That's yeah. that's the part about this that that's so crazy. You know, it's such a scary couple of stories. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Where, like I said, they are lucky that nobody died, and to know that those sort of things are are really happening inside a person's head. It's not just I'm imagining things. Right. You are, mm -hmm. but it's really happening in mm -hmm. your head. Do you think? Uh, sorry to interrupt. No, you. you're no, you're good. Do you think? Interrupt me, whatever. Fine, fuck. <laughs> whatever. Get him. Do you? Do I think what? Just speak. <laughs> I'm fuck just you. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Do um, I think what? Do you think that the you know when they were talking about when he was at a show or whatever and somebody gave him LSD? Do you think that that had something to do with that whole devil thing? I think so. You I think, think that it was like bad trip, like you know, bad trips and stuff mm -hmm. like that's why I've never messed with right. any kind of drug like that because gosh, uh, you hear not very often, but there are Horror times stories, when people yeah. don't come out of that the same person. And when right. they do, it's a very conspiracy minded, like everybody's mm -hmm. out to get them, the devil and demons yeah. are in things. Like, do you think that, I mean, obviously it didn't help, but do you think that that exacerbated it to a point that it wouldn't have gone to had he not? done that i i think so yeah i think because um, it seemed like there was a turning point there where it was like that's yeah. when the whole devil part came in yeah. that's a good point yeah and go ahead bryce yeah um i think with his schizophrenia like mm -hmm. that 
mm-hmm. really brought that on. And then yeah. it wasn't just like a one-time thing. He started doing a lot of acid after right. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, which. But the uh, guy at the dentist from the butthole oh surfers, my God. he had, he had nothing that. to do with that, he, did he? he, he yeah, <laughs> Why no, were they God. at the dentist with that guy? Is it You got to like get him where to, you can get him, I guess. Yeah, yeah. but I mean. <sighs> he needed more dental, dental work. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> like of all places for that man to be it's he's in the right seriously? place yeah. it seemed like a real dentist but it might have been filmed in not a real dentist office like, yeah uh, okay <laughs> I but uh i believe he was the one uh who produced uh daniel's record when he signed with atlantic okay. oh okay. so i think he played a big role there yeah. right but yeah i just and, thought and, it was very funny that he was at the dentist yeah. because his teeth are fucked yeah <laughs> <laughs> i it, it's interesting when you talk about the the lsd um experience that he had because that was in the film the part where he really started going on about Mm-hmm. demons and, and devils if i remember correctly yeah. bryce yeah. you've seen it 10 times I, I do believe that that's about the spot where he started really talking about that mm-hmm. whether that's good storytelling on the part of the filmmakers or could if it, you know or if it's you know really what did it and like you said that could be a, a breaking point mm-hmm. you know we when we did our fantastic fungi mm-hmm. episode they talk about how certain psychedelics can can create new pathways and, it and alters change your things brain. in your brain. Yeah. Right. To to where, you know, now you're Permanent. seeing things permanently. Yeah. Permanently. And That's hopefully that for the better. That's me. why they say if you're, you know, in that in that documentary that we watched, they talk about if you're gonna do it, do it with a guide and do mm-hmm. it in the right scenario, do it, you know, at the right dosage and all that stuff. Um, Definitely not in the 80s at some f- fucking yeah. show. Butthole surfer right. show. Yeah. When you've already got <laughs> mental illness. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. But the supply is there. It's right. easy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, but that just, I mean, to me, like that is the scariest part mm-hmm. is that even somebody without a, a you know, a significant mental illness mm-hmm. beforehand can do a drug like that and come out of it. Not seeing demons right. and, and doing yeah <laughs> yeah and, and potentially doing things right that, yeah, yeah that they might but not that, do. that they don't that their mind doesn't snap back from that, right. that you know that's scary it's so scary yeah because that yeah not only was that kind of a turning point for like where he was mentally but also he bashed his former manager over the head with a pipe right. oh bashed God. him three times yeah <laughs> yeah and then mm-hmm. and then enters um uh, Jeff Tartikov. Yep. yep. Um, mm-hmm. Who is just an incredible manager. Right. Did literally more than he ever <laughs> should have, should maybe. Have done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, th- another interesting thing, uh, I kind of mentioned this already, but I want to bring it up again. Daniel sounded just like all the early 2000 hipsters bands mm-hmm. um, that they wanted to sound like the quirky lyrics, the simple chords, making all the kids who smell like patchouli and, you know, um, they wear scarves in the summer and shit like that. Um, Talk about how genius this band is, you know, whatever. It feels so much less cringy coming from someone like Daniel though. Yeah. (laughs) That it did from that, because that's who he really was. Right. You you could tell it was really pure. It wasn't just like, let's say the weirdest shit that we can, you know, we can figure out. And then all the little hipster kids will dance around and, you know, (laughs) the worst we smell at our beards and, yeah, but it, we can afford to drive a brand new uh, yeah, BMW Subaru, or yeah. whatever it is. <laughs> Why was it a Subaru? Why was that well, your Well, because go-to? lesbians drive Subarus. <laughs> that that is the stereotype. Yeah, yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> I got the best Birkenstocks. <laughs> oh, I love my lesbian friends with oh, Subarus. Man. Sorry to any of you listening. Kim <laughs> Yeah. Cut that part she out. She said Kim Whitehill. <laughs> it's an inside joke. She's not really a lesbian, obviously. Good. It's not obvious to me. I've never... Yeah, anyway. Um, what were you she, saying, Bryce? She's married to a man. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> doesn't mean doesn't mean she's straight. No. No. I, didn't, I never said she was straight. Okay. Fair. Does she have a Subaru? God, <laughs> we called her out with her first and last name. That's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. All right, here we go. Cut back in. Ready? Okay, yep. Three, two, one. Bryce, what did you have to say about that? I'm sorry. 
Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> back to the acid. He wrote a song about doing acid with Caroline, and it was fun. It was fun. It was fun. That's yeah. the song? That's yeah, the so lyric. it's like this lighthearted, childlike, fun song, but also fun. he's doing Talking things about... like bashing managers over the head with pipes. Lead pipes, yeah. Yep. Um, I loved how much material, like what we talked about a little bit, um, there was to draw from. Mm -hmm. um, I liked that all the cassette tapes that we saw were the actual ones because it looked, it yeah. was so, it was so, um, so Jeff Fears it. Fjordzig, um, he <laughs> said that uh, that was, you know, he went and had to listen to every single stitch of of music, every word, every, every everything, every, every, everything, every, 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 everything. And <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Yep. Ugh. It's a lot of material to go over. Yeah. <laughs> but it made the documentary better because if they wouldn't have had that oh, much, yeah. it wouldn't, I mean, it would have it just been people sitting there talking about him and right. it's hard to envision that stuff. So the fact that he had so much footage of actual it life. A lot, a lot to pull from, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that- Too much. <laughs> yeah. It made, made me motion sick first mm -hmm. and foremost. But secondly, it made the documentary a little bit better just because- Real footage is always right. oh, better. Always. Always better. Just because you can't invent, well, and, you know, dramatization of that kind of stuff is always corny. It's yeah, always like the no, cheesiest thing. There's ever. no way to do it, and it's not corny. No. I've, no. I've yet to find one anyway. <laughs> no, me either. Um, all right. So Daniel had a job at McDonald's for a while, which he took very seriously for a bit. It said that he, he was McDonald's most famous employee. Was this before or after he bought the moped? Right. Do we got to um, go back a little bit? Because I want to talk about how he went and joined the carnival. Was that? Yeah. So this was um, after, right? My, yeah, might have been after. Okay. Um, because he got yeah, watched the documentary. He guys. got evicted from his I brothers did. and then moved in with his sister. Yeah, and I wrote something down about living with his sister too, about how he thrived at his sister's house because he was allowed to make a mess. Yeah. Like that to me spoke volumes. Like. Maybe, you know, he wasn't allowed to, like, take up space in. What? I'm wondering why that's going so shitty. Oh, it's because it's way laggy. Way laggy. Way laggy. Because, look, I'm not, I haven't touched my, my, uh, thing for a really long time. Do, 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 do. Hopefully it all goes. <laughs> okay, well. Anyway. <laughs> Anyways, we... like maybe he wasn't allowed to, to to take up much space at home. Mm. Not like physical space, but like, you know what I mean? Like he wasn't allowed to like, you know how it is when you have to, when you feel like you have to clean up after yourself all the time and you can't, mm -hmm. like if you leave one little crumb somewhere that somebody's going to yell at you or like. Say you're not pulling your weight or doing your thing or whatever. Well, it like it's like, like having that might somebody be the kind stand of... right. So <laughs> when he was at his sister's, he was able to kind of. I mean, and they showed. I don't know if it was actual footage of it or not, yeah. but it was a mess. Yeah, <laughs> it was disgusting. Yeah. Um, and then like right after they were talking about that, they were like, and then he bought a moped and joined the carnival. Like, yeah. excuse me, what? Right. Just, That's like, fucking insane. Like, so are, you've got this guy who is completely unstable, right? And you're you, he has zero like super. I, I realize he's an adult, but there's mm -hmm. no supervision whatsoever. Like right. he can just go buy a fucking moped and join a fucking circus, yeah, <laughs> or I mean, whatever. I mean, that's like, kind that's of insane. that's kind of the 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 role that's cut out for guys like him, though, right? I mean, isn't that well, the, yeah? Isn't that sort of the stereotypical when you can't do anything else, you join the yeah the, the carnival, the carnival you go and, be a and, and you somewhere. go and and you're in with. Other, you know, transient, transient people. weirdos, quote unquote, yeah. you know, and to me, it's like, ha, 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 you, you can't write a no. story that's more, you know, on it's, the nose than that. It sounds made up. Mm -hmm. It does. <laughs> it does. Yeah. yeah. You, you go from, <laughs> from you. Daniel being at home and then his parents are there and his mom's mm -hmm. trying to get him to do chores and 
um, everything <laughs> yeah. to this isn't working out. Uh, yeah. Go go live with your brother who's trying to be a really good mentor. Right. And get Daniel into yeah. like the balance of life and have a job and yeah. like work his own way. Um, to getting evicted from there, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. moving in with his sister, who gives Daniel the space to be himself, which is happy and all. But Daniel was it being detrimental? Him, right. Daniel being himself means if the opportunity to join the carnival happens, it's going to happen. It's happening. He's skipping right. town on right. a moped to join it. Yeah, yeah. he's he hopping on a train. Yeah, and, and he didn't call for like quite a while Months, yeah it yeah. sounded like yeah. he called on was, father's day wasn't until saying, father's day yeah saying yeah. like you know oh i'm okay like why why are you even worried <laughs> yeah right so <laughs> which is just crazy yeah and then at that point he's in houston yeah. uh, which is where i think he starts working at mcdonald's after, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah after yeah. he meets up with um kathy mccarthy kathy. And, and glass eye glass eye yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and I thought it was interesting too. Sorry, no, go. I thought it was interesting too that like when he found himself in trouble when he after he got jumped or whatever, he just went to a church and they were like, "Let's get you an apartment." <laughs> like, yeah. is that really all I have to do to get a place to live? And like in Houston, I'm going to Houston. Church, church of Christ. Seriously, find a church yeah. of Christ. All right, yeah. let's do it. Yeah, I, I think Daniel just had something about him that yeah, he that people was... just wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, him. I feel like you need some help, you sir, and, and I think I'm going to do that for you. Right. Um, I feel like it's probably not safe for you to be just out here on the streets. Yeah. yeah. As we alluded to, so he goes, he has this job at McDonald's. He ends up attacking his manager with a pipe at one point, um, which sent Daniel into to a psychiatric hospital. Um, while he was at the psychiatric hospital, though, and 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 Daniel kind of retired from music. That's when his following blew up. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Tartikoff was out there doing the Lord's work, copying all of his cassettes, sending them all out, making that the t-shirts. That is the coolest part about this whole documentary, yeah, in my opinion. For sure. And the like feet on the ground, like the DIY, just going out and yes. giving the tapes to people. And that's the heart of this documentary. Oh my God. Dubbing tapes, watching him do that mm -hmm. was like, it took me back there yeah. immediately. Pushing the, the play and record at the same yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's getting all this recognition for his music and, um, eventually he starts getting noticed because, uh, none of, uh, none other than Kurt Cobain is wearing one of his shirts, the same one that Bryce is wearing, but reversed in color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because Bryce is a little bit of a goth kid. Sometimes he's wearing all black. <laughs> he, <laughs> so if you're not watch if you're not watching on YouTube, you should be. So, okay. never mind. Um, you could see this shirt and more. Yeah, oh, you'll never. What does that you'll mean? You'll never know what's on our actual stream unless you get on there. You won't notice our our sign here that says "Welcome Strangers" with the with the uh, little monster guy on it's it. It's a frog. V v yeah, it looks like an alien. That's not a fucking frog. What sound does the frog make? Oh, Hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, you got to listen to the been? album. Yeah. Come on, there's a little Captain America. Anyway. Um, there's a little Captain America. <laughs> Two large record labels go after Daniel. So Electra and Atlantic, they're in a bidding war for Daniel while, while he's in the psych hospital, which is fucking crazy. Yeah, that is nuts. No pun intended. Um, he was able to get a contract um, that was known, at least at the time, to be one of the most one-sided record deals ever made in favor of an artist. Mm -hmm. Um they actually took his mental health into consideration with it, which was pretty cool. But because Electra had Metallica on their label, who Daniel believed them to be evil, <laughs> which they're not, they're just corporate assholes too, just like everyone else. Yep. Um, he decided to sign to uh, sign with Atlantic and to fire his manager, Jeff Tartikoff, which bad idea, bad move. Daniel. Bad move. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, that sucks. Any any time something was going good in Daniel's life, sabotage. Daniel would make it go bad. Yeah, yeah. and this was sabotage type of a situation. This was probably sure. the the worst of it. Right. Yeah. Um, that's when Dan put out his tape "Fun," which ended up being his worst. Not like, very much. Yeah. 
Not. It ended up being not very much. Fine. It sold like two thousand copies. Yeah. Yeah. It was through, his like through Atlantic. least <laughs> least most bestest one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wow, there's one. <laughs> can I? I probably can't do Crazy Dave or Creepy Dave uh, on here because he'll get mad at me. Who will? Creepy Dave. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> hey, that's my best most. My, <laughs> what? my my best most favorite episode. <laughs> and my fancy butthole. Your fancy butthole. <laughs> it was creepy so Dave. Lost. Okay, bye. Okay. Uh, <laughs> creepy Dave does some fun videos. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's all. Creepy Dave. Uh, uh, reach out to us. Info documentary at gmail.com and you, did you forget what it was yeah i forgot what... <laughs> that's, that's why you had to say shit. it earlier <laughs> uh. Uh. okay so daniel johnston's art was interesting right yeah oh yeah so i he... liked the little the little uh yeah did we have favorites the, fins? the the little tiny fin guys do you know mm-hmm. what i'm talking about yeah so oh, let me play this portion right here a po- little portion here well well, yeah, there's some themes, you know, I mean, uh, with the artwork, I do some you know, Captain America's, you know, some ducks. I do a lot of ducks, and they're like my armies, and sometimes I use them in my battles against Satan. Oh, my God. Daniel's art mirrors his songwriting in many ways. The same characters, the same themes. There are plenty of drawings that refer to unrequited love. You'll find the same characters such as Casper the Friendly Ghost, Captain America, Frankenstein appears quite often. You have Joe the Boxer and the eternal struggle, the eternal battle. For two years, all Daniel drew were fight scenes of a boxer fighting a creature in the ring. The boxer clearly represented Daniel while the uh, creature was evil. This was Vile Corrupt from the Hi How Are You album. The piece titled Daniel Johnston's Symbolical Visions is in many ways the Rosetta Stone of Daniel's art. It has all the figures and symbols that appear in so many of his drawings, from Kathy McCarty's glasses to a baby block to the man with the sawed-off head to torsos. All of the familiar figures are there, 666, eyes, the pyramid. If you listen to all of Daniel's music and know the songs and then look at the drawings, they have added meaning. Sometimes very hard to fathom what goes on in his mind. I can see what he's thinking just day by day in his drawings. He will uh, put captions on his drawings that are coming right from deep inside. And by looking over his shoulder every day, I can get a little bit of what goes on in his mind. A friend of mine that saw his art that's in the mental health field said, um, I know Daniel's going to heaven. He's already been to hell. She was looking at the artwork and she said, this is hellacious. I mean, someone tortured. And I don't even see it that way. A lot of his artwork I see is very happy and he really believes in love. I think he looks for that superhero idea of someone's gonna rescue or save and be the good guy. Did we have a favorite in in Daniel's art? Something that he did or a, or a recurring, show that to the camera there. The, is that a little Jesus? Yeah. That's cool. It says Jesus is a vampire and he's saying Alakazam. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> this is my favorite one. Yeah. I do like the, the hi, how are you, the recurring, the eyeball thing, you know, mm-hmm. they, that guy just referred to it as the vile corrupt. Mm-hmm. Um but I think my favorite was the ducks. I loved the ducks. <laughs> the most of them had little teeth. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. What about you, uh, Bryce? What was your What was your best most favorite? <laughs> best, best most favorite Daniel Johnston was. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I they talked a little bit of the fight scenes. Um, yeah, and and I think that's good because it's always like the the heroes Mm -hmm. winning and beating this creature. Yeah. Um, So there's one of like Frankenstein with some boxing gloves and yeah. Yeah. You like, (laughs) you like the, the sawed off 
head Joe boxer kind of guy. Yeah. It's just an interesting way. I mean, when they did the animation of mm -hmm. him losing his mind with, yeah. Yeah. With the sawed off man. That's yeah. Yeah. That was fun. <laughs> yep. I agree. Okay. Lauren. Yes. Do you remember when we went to that museum that was the old mental the, hospital? The Glore. Is it Glore? Glore. 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 One of the exhibits showed um, the drawings from the residents. Yeah. So it's, to me, um, there's something, and we talked about it a little bit already, but there's something about seeing something coming straight out of the mind of someone that maybe doesn't communicate the same way or doesn't or has a hard time expressing themselves and being able to look at, you know, an unfiltered look into their side. And that's, and that's what his dad was saying in that clip we just listened mm -hmm. to was I could tell, I'd look over his shoulder and I could tell what was going on in his, in his brain by the things he was drawing and the things he was writing. You know, it it's a little bit scary yeah. to see that. Sometimes because, you know, the, the psychiatric person or whatever, the, the person in the mental health field that his sister was talking about, she said he's been to hell. Well, if you look at the fo the photos of the pictures he was drawing when they talked about that, some of them did look pretty scary. And then other ones looked very hopeful and very happy. And, you know, it's just that something about that outlet, mm -hmm. you know, to especially with someone who has the sort of innate ability to recall shapes and whatnot, you know, it's not just, you know, a, you know, you watch the horror movies where you've got a kid who draws the house and then the little scary figure in the background, you know, mm -hmm. it's not as cliche as that. And it's also not as bad as, you know, just black circles all over everything. You know, you just, every page has a black circle on it. We're talking about someone who can recall you know, as simple as Bryce's shirt or the the thing, you know, but you can recall without looking at something, the the shapes of a frog's leg or the, 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 or what the hand does when it comes back to punch. He didn't have any training, you know, like some of the people I know, some of the people that have been on this show, like tattoo artists and things, they have that ability, but they've also worked very hard to get that. Mm -hmm. He's going... He never had to have that. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he's doing basically the same kind of art at the beginning that he was doing toward the end. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to say that it never got any better because I'm not like an expert in Daniel Johnston's, mm -hmm. you know, full catalog. But, you know, it, it's just a. There are dogs upstairs? No. That was laughing, I thought. I know. It sounded like. Dogs? Like Chihuahuas. Thought it sounded like turkeys. I'm gonna go tell them that. Okay. <laughs> it sounded like a bunch of hands. All right. <laughs> um, before we get into our feelings, I do want to mention that sadly Daniel Johnson did pass away on September 11th in 2019 at his home in Waller, Texas, where he was living at the end of the documentary. I guess I don't know if it was the same home, but it's the same town at least. Um, he was only 58 years old when he died of a suspected heart attack. He is believed to have died overnight, a day after he had been released from the hospital for unspecified kidney problems. What I read about the funeral and what uh, Jeff Fierzig said about it, it sounded very sweet. There were over 100 mourners there, and they spoke about the theme of love and hope that runs through much of Daniel's music, and that the reception... Several musicians performed covers of Daniel Johnston's songs, which I think is really cool. There's probably a million more things we could talk about about this documentary. There's a lot of things that happened, um, a lot of people that were introduced, and you know, but we could be, you know, it's already been an hour and fifteen minutes and or so, and you know, we could we could probably keep going, and we still have the end of our show to get to. So let's move along. Anything else? Final things before we get into feelings? Mm -mm. Nope. Okay. How did you feel when the credits rolled Lauren? Happy it was over. Fuck. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I One of the last things I wrote down is, was 
I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I ju- I felt relief when it was over. I felt. Um, but how did you feel watching Daniel dance around as Casper the Friendly Ghost? I mean, that was kind of fun. Yeah, it was. I liked that <laughs> mask a yeah. lot. Yeah, for sure. A lot, a lot. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I didn't really have many feelings other than thank God <laughs> that's done. Like, I just, I'm not. That this is not for me. Yep. Understood, <laughs> Bryce. <laughs> It it felt like I had been on a journey, mm-hmm. um, and it felt like a bit of mixed emotions. Yep. Because one of the last things we hear is his parents talk about, you know, we want Daniel to be able to take care of himself mm-hmm. and be okay on his own, and we think we're running out of time on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the same time, it's you feel good that Daniel's in this spot where he's being taken care of and that he can continue to make art and do it without throwing his meds out the window. And right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, some mixed emotions. So when I watched this film, I didn't know for sure that, that Daniel Johnston had died already. So he died several years after the film was released. And I wasn't sure. I didn't look it up until after the film. So I didn't have his death weighing on me, on my feelings at the end. It was just kind of like, I was sort of waiting for it to say like Dana Johnson passed away mm-hmm. at, you know, so, uh, but it didn't. So I, I felt a little hopeful, a little inspired, a little inspired, but I also felt sad because um, I just, I, I, when I feel like there may be, and I, I don't want to, to say that there wasn't the proper treatment for what he was dealing with, because a lot of it was his own, you know, not mm-hmm. doing what he needed to do. Um, little inspiration, little hope, little sadness. That's kind of kind of how I was feeling. But I, I also was, you know, as much as I did like this, I was. I probably won't be rewatching this a whole bunch. You know, this wasn't something that I feel, you know. It's not like some of our others that I that I will probably re revisit. So, but I really did like it. So, uh, I consider this when I talk about films being well made. I consider this to be one of the better made documentaries we've watched, with regard to how well the filmmaking fits the subject matter. Mm-hmm. Um, there was almost an insurmountable amount of work that had to go into getting the story put together, and do it correctly in a way that people can understand and keeps people's attention. I feel like Fjurzig really handled Daniel's mental illness like a pro, portrayed it so gen- gently and genuinely, but also so empowering. Um, so I consider this to be a pretty well-made documentary. What do you guys think? I agree. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was really well-made. Very, very made. DIY, was, too, which was yeah, kind of Fjurzig's thing. Cool. So. Um. Bryce, this one's for you. Okay. What do you think, if anything, was the message trying to be conveyed? Was it just to tell a story or was there a, a underlying message to this? I, I I think that it was just telling a story. I, I think you can draw your own messages from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, yeah, there's a lot you can take away from it. Sure. But I think that was just part of the story. You think you think the message, the heartbeat of this was the story of Daniel Johnston, not so much we need to tell, to, to give a message, we just need to tell a story. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Kinda, yeah. <laughs> okay. Lauren, you agree or disagree? Um, I agree. I think I can't pull a message out of it. I don't know. I think okay. it was just yeah. telling Daniel's story and... Sure. You know, if you learn something from it, then great. If not, you learned Daniel's story, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Well, what on did that you note, think? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that it was, um, there was a, a compelling story to tell, and you tell it with as, as much respect and leaving all, try, trying to tell it as fully as you can. 
in less than two hours. Right. You know, with all kind of like this a, stuff. like just like a behind the music type mm-hmm. of a situation where absolutely he's just telling the story of the yep. musician or the artist. Yep. All right. Finally, we've come to the time where we need to rate this documentary with an official documentary rating. Each crew member scores the documentary on a scale of one to 10 items, with 10 being as bad as jumping out a window and breaking your legs. Did I just say that wrong? 10, yeah. be, 10 being okay. as bad? Yeah. With one <laughs> being as bad I wouldn't have even as jumping that. out a window and breaking your legs on the way down. Or when you hit the ground, I guess. And 10 being as good as Casper the Fwanly Ghost. The item that is used for scoring changes each week, depending on the content of the documentary that we watch. This week, we'll be using eyeball drawings as our rating item. So let's start with Bryce. How many eyeball drawings, Bruce? Uh, That would be 10 eyeballs. 10 eyeballs. This is your favorite. It is. We've already talked about that. You love this. There's nothing you better. Love it. He- heavily seen. biased. I- <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, more people should watch it. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's Just go- take care when you watch it, because it's not healthy for some people. <laughs> 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 All right, sister. Since you clearly are on the other end of that uh, yeah. scale, how many eyeball drawings was this worth to you? I gave this one three eyeball drawings. Okay. I gave it three because I thought it was really well made. I think that the production of it was great and the story was, you know, well put together. You just didn't enjoy it. It was, I I, I didn't enjoy the way it made me feel. Yep. Fair enough. And that was, it was visceral. How it made me feel was like palpable. So I didn't like that so much. I didn't want to sit through this. (laughs) Right, right. Yep. I equate it kind of to like the same feeling I had when I was watching uh, one of those like pray the gay away ones or, uh, you know, the ch- sure. the churchy ones that yep. hit a little bit too close to mm-hmm. home. Mm-hmm. I gave this eight eyeball drawings because I really liked it. Um, it didn't get higher than that because um, I think that's still a pretty good score i guess and uh i i liked it more after talking with the director of this film because getting some insight on that is always uh very i don't know it just kind of puts your bias towards the yeah (laughs) you know you become a fan of that person and then you want to be a fan of what they do Mm -hmm. as well so (laughs) knowing all the sleepless nights and the work spent on it really Mm -hmm. it does yeah yeah, it it helps it helps bring that score up a little bit too so after averaging everyone's scores together the official documentary rating for the devil and daniel johnston is seven eyeball drawings Woo! Woo! thanks everybody uh, in the room and our listeners for putting your homemade cassette tapes into your boom box this evening with us. Hopefully your tape deck didn't eat the tape Hopefully. and you have to go in there with your fingernail and try to turn it to wind it back or put like a pencil, pencil in there. Yeah. Pencils are good. Yeah. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you're, then you're younger young to than be listening to this. Episode. Yeah, then you probably hated this. Episode. <laughs> then it's, it's past your bedtime. Right. <laughs> Uh, as always, thanks to Lauren and Bryce. You're both great. I'll totally promote your music when uh, you get into the psych hospital, or I'll hmm. put if you if your drawings, and I'll put them on Etsy and sell them for you. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm gonna need a manager named Jeff. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. Well, I'll find one for you. <laughs> yeah. Because that's what good managers do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jeff. What. Kick Satan out. Kick, Kick Satan, Satan out. out. <laughs> uh, I have that written down as a quote. Kick Satan out. Kick Satan out. Kick why, Satan out. Why am I having out. trouble remembering what the fuck this is? Is that a thing? It was in the documentary, <laughs> Mr. I've seen it ten times. Oh. <laughs> Wow, color wow. me, color me silly. Okay, let's talk about next week's episode. <laughs> color me silly. First, let me ask you a question. Okay. Have you ever had a dream? Yes. Ha- ha- <laughs> Have you ever had a dream and then when you woke up, you felt like it had been really, really real? 
Mm -hmm. So real that maybe you're like mad at your partner or you like, uh, maybe you think you did something wrong or something like that. Have, is, have either of you had? Yeah. Speak. You don't just nod. I can't hear you. <laughs> yes. I've said yes 15 times. Yeah, a time or two. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, next week, we're going to be diving into the story of a father's journey to free his son, Ryan, from a 40-year prison sentence for a brutal murder in which his son was convicted based on someone else's dream. A murder he did not commit, but someone <laughs> dreamed what? that he did. Yeah, we're watching the 2015 true crime documentary called Dream Killer. Oh, I can't Dream wait. slash killer. Have either of you heard of this? No. Uh -huh. It looks wild. I haven't seen it yet. I'm excited to watch it. But it looks wild. For basically, from the from the trailer, it's like somebody dreamed that he killed someone, and this other person was his accomplice, and none of it happened that way. And I don't know. It sounds crazy. So everyone, go out yeah. check out the documentary Dream Slash Killer. It's like Dream slash killer i don't know how, <laughs> i guess it's just dream killer but uh check it out before next week's episode as i said at the beginning rate and review our podcast follow us on all the stuff if you've been listening this long go to our social media or our youtube and com which i guess is social media as well so yes. any of it uh, and comment the word yes. bless you I'm mountain dew <laughs> yeah how about mountain dew Mountain Dew's a good one. Yeah, we, we didn't, even talk, we didn't even talk about Mountain Dew. Mountain we Dew. drink Mountain Dew. Uh. <laughs> we drink Mountain Dew. Uh. Hey. <laughs> I don't I just don't like the uh keeps the demons uh. away. So <laughs> we drink Mountain away. Dew. <laughs> All right. So comment the word Mountain Dew and we'll give you a shout out on one of our future episodes. Next week, join us as we dream someone into a guilty verdict one documentary at a time on behalf of Lauren. That's me. Bruce. That's me. Matt and DJ <laughs> in that booth and the entire documentary family. I am your host, Jeff Kwanski. And, <laughs> and I want to thank you all for listening. I hope you keep your minds open and be kind to each other. Goodbye. Welcome, strangers, to this edition of Talkumentary Insider. This is a bonus feature of our regular broadcast called Talkumentary, where we get to pick the brains of the people involved in these wonderful documentaries that we cover. I am here with my friendly ghost of a co-host over there, Mr. Bryce Necker. What's up, Bryce? Hello, hello. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. <laughs> are you excited about this one this evening? I am very excited about it, yeah. Good, good. Um, one of the, the documentaries that we covered recently on our main show is a film from 2005, or I believe it was released in 2005, chronicling the life of American artist and musician Daniel Johnston. It is called The Devil and Daniel Johnston. If you haven't seen the film, go and see this film. And then listen to our main show, documentary, covering it. Um, we'd love it if you check those things out before listening to this. Otherwise, settle in for the next, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes or so. And we're going to pick the brain of a very, very special guest for this episode of Insider. He's known for films such as Half Japanese, The Band That Would Be King, The Dude, The Real Rocky, author of the JT Leroy story. And of course, he is the director of the devil and Daniel Johnston. It is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Fjorzig. Hi, Jeff. Hey, guys. How you doing? Doing very nice well. Nice. nice to meet you as well. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah, my pleasure. The, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things for us, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we're just under a year old as a podcast and, you know, I'm, I'm going and I'm, I'm reaching out to, to people that I respect and admire. And I'm going, you know, if it, if they reach out back, that's, that's cool. And if they don't, that's cool too. And and so I always get excited when I see that little bubble pop up. I'm like, oh man, this, this is going to be a lot of fun. So we're really excited to have you here. I'm actually going to start off um, asking Bryce a quick question. Um, oh. Bryce, why don't you start off by talking to both Jeffs here um, and about what this documentary has meant to you and why you advocated so hard to get this onto our show. And then 
why you're so stoked to have Jeff here today. Yeah. Uh, start with you. Starting with me. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It only gets better from here. Yep. <laughs> uh, no, I uh, I saw The Devil and Daniel Johnston uh, years ago. Um, it was streaming on Prime at the time. And I thought, this looks interesting. And then you, you start a movie thinking you're not going to sit there and watch the whole thing, but I couldn't look away and yeah. just got completely wrapped up in it. And yeah, then I told everyone about it yep. and some people watched it. And yep. then we just talk about it all the time. <laughs> Yeah, there, and, there's a lot of a lot of quotable moments in the, in that yeah. film, um, and just in the life of Daniel Johnston, I, I would imagine as well. And Jeff, I'm sure you're going to be able to speak a little bit more towards that. Um, so Jeff, uh, half Japanese, the band that would be king, the Devil and Daniel Johnston, the real Rocky, the JT Leroy story. You have some pretty heavy hitters under your belt, man. Um, I'm sure all ins- aspiring filmmakers. Want to know, you know, when you, when you, how do you know when you have a subject that's worth putting your heart and soul into within a documentary? Like, is this something that you just feel or is, you, you know, you obviously put a lot of time, effort, resources into making this film and all of your films. Is it just passion for a certain thing or is there, I mean, what, what is that process like for you? Well, you know, every one of those films are independent films that, you know, an idea sort of popped into my head one day. Mm-hmm. And they're all story based, like story is king. And if I can find a story that I can get inside and then spend a few years going down a rabbit hole inside that story, mm-hmm. that's a film for yep. me. Um, so yeah, Devil and Daniel Johnston was my second feature. Half Japanese, the band that would be king, is my first feature. Right. When I was uh, quite young, right out of college. Mm-hmm. And that was an indie film that I self-financed. Uh, I was a commercial wow. director. And, um, but I wanted to be an independent filmmaker when I was young. Indie film had sort of... Um, magically appeared around 85 here in the, here in the States... Uh, we had Jim Jarmish, Spike Lee. Those were yeah. really powerful. It's a powerful moment. It was like America's new wave. And I was just the right age um, to get that. Uh, right. I was doing college radio. I was very much a part of the underground music scene coming out of uh, punk rock, post-punk, yeah. and, yep. and indie, indie music. Um, and that whole DIY mentality Mm-hmm. of music scene that I was very much a part of, I I just applied that to film and to documentary that, that year, you know. Mm-hmm. I started with Half Jeff in 1990. Wow. So documentary was not a hot thing or, uh, by any stretch of imagination. It was, it was like PBS, eat your vegetables. Uh-huh. <laughs> very, very cool. uh, certainly Hollywood wanted nothing to do with it. Right. And that, that was great. So, uh, you know, for me to get in on the indie film scene that I want to be part of, for pennies on the dollar, you know, like an indie film that scripted, which I also do, I'm a screenwriter, I'm a WGA screenwriter. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, one of those films ever got made. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that those films cost millions of dollars and half Jap, I spent probably $90,000 over three years wow. of my own money from commercial directing fees. I was doing burgers, chickens, right. cars, sneak, political candidates, you name it, yeah. I directed it. And it was a great training ground, but I, I put my money where my mouth is. And I said, I'm gonna invest in myself because Hollywood wasn't gonna, at that time, and probably never pay for a half Japanese film, that's for sure. Right. So, uh, you know, I just was, I wanted to document the underground. And a lot of my, documentary heroes were really from the 60s, Albert Maisel's, Penna Baker. I love those films. Those are verite films. That was, yeah. That's not exactly what I do. It's fine, but I love them. But nobody nobody was doing that. It was very expensive to roll 16 millimeter in 1990. And, and that's, what you, that's what you did half jap on, right? Yes, that was 16 millimeter. Right. And um, 
you know, it got a theatrical in art houses across the United States. Mm -hmm. And that was a big part of it. Like for me, it was like, it's, I'm very proud of the film. It's not a perfect film by any stretch of the imagination. It's not a home run the way Devil turned out, but it was where I was at that young age and the abilities I had to try to show off my chops, you know? And that's what I did. But it was a story I really wanted to tell. And it's a funny film, and I wanted it to be funny. And, um, you know, people liked it. And uh, it, it it got shown in, you know, we showed it in film forum in New York. Yeah. Two-week run before we opened. That was like a dream come true for me. But what we did in every city, we wanted to make an event. There was local, well, there was, um, you know, the Village Voice. Every city, every cool city had an arts paper back then. That's right. how a film would be promoted. And to get ink, you know, you had to do the work yourself. After you make the film, you now got to promote the film and show the film and somehow get an audience. So that's what I was doing. And we would have half Japanese play often in the theater right after the credits roll. So we would oh, make yeah. an event. And nobody had done that. That was like Chicago, Toronto, New York, so LA. You're, you're paving the way for a lot of, of a lot of how people are doing uh, at least some screenings for some of these more indie and DIY films. That's pretty sweet, man. Well, that's, that's, that was the fun. It was like, let's bring the fun. Let's make it mm -hmm. fun and event for people, for cinema geeks, music freaks, whatever, yep. to come out and have a great evening and blow their minds. And, and we did that in every city, but we would get ink in uh, Chicago Reader, LA Weekly, Film Pick of the Week, up against Hollywood movies. They, you know, they, they, we were like a sleeper cell. Right. You know, we, we <laughs> knew what we were doing to try to, like, shake up the culture. That's We were just trying to have fun because half Japanese are fun. Right. Um, so that's what I did. And, um, you know, that film is somewhat available if you want to track it down. Yeah. It's actually being shown here in Echo Park next week. People keep inviting that film out, and that's fine. But that's really off of what happened with Devil, which is, of course, what we're going to start talking about. I guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can talk about whatever you want. That's just that's what that's what brought you into our purview was, uh, was Bryce bringing the, the the Devil and Daniel Johnson to us. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that, man. Do you, do you feel like uh, when you're making these films, so it has a very um, like you said DIY sort of underground punk vibe to it, which. I think you pulled off very nicely and, you know, both Bryce and I have, have dabbled in, you know, this was, uh, you know, early two thousands, you know, when that was like the, the in initial run of some of these more underground punk and, and, you know, hardcore and all that was, was something that, you know, was, was sort of just making its way to the Midwest, I think, um, where we're from and, you know, I think I speak for both of us. We were both sort of enthralled with that. And so that's probably why the two of us. So we have a crew of probably like seven people or so that do this show. Um, I'm the main host and these guys kind of, they kind of rotate in and out, but the two of us, I think sort of gripped onto a, 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 a film like the devil and Daniel Johnson, because it really has that sort of underground indie mm -hmm. feel. And I think that's sort of what a lot of people love about the music scene, like you were speaking to. And I, I just to compliment you, I think you did a wonderful job of, of kind of merging those two things and, and giving that to kids like us and that are, you know, uh, interested in that, I suppose. Um, do you think though, that does every can can a, a can skill in filmmaking make anything interesting, or do you have to have uh, do you have to have something that you consider to be, you know, gold before you're gonna like start digging into it, or at least have an idea of of which direction you're gonna go, or do you think that you can kind of if you do it right, can anything be? told i don't know if that if i'm if i'm making sense with that question i'm just curious about when you when you dig into stuff how you kind of choose that material well you know let's just use devil for an example so you know i was in college radio mm -hmm. i was a dj in the 80s uh, in wtsr trenton as well as wprb princeton okay and the underground was very very real now it's online somewhere but Back then, it was on, in fanzines. Uh -huh. And 
a lot of this music, you know, listen, I listen to all kinds of music. Sure. It's not just punk rock. Neil Johnson's not punk rock. No. So, you know, the point is that he's coming out of a folk tradition in piano and acoustic guitar, and, but it's really singer songwriter. Right. Anyway, the point is that he started making a splash and a scene in the, in the, in the deep underground. And I heard about it, mm -hmm. but most important was, well, there's a lot of things that happened. So in 85, when he's, he invents lo-fi, he's taking the cassette recorder, a little Radio Shack thing, and he's right. he's making like six albums in a basement in West Virginia with this cassette recorder. It's crazy. This is a guy who's, you know, not going to an expensive recording studio, not letting get anything get in the way. It's just the songwriting and the playing. Right. And he's prolific, and he's doing all this. And he's releasing this stuff on the cheapest tapes you've ever seen, <laughs> the shittiest you know, clamshells and the yep. glue is and the primitive artwork and mm -hmm. selling them for like three bucks a pop. And, you know, I saw an ad for this, uh, for these tapes in a fanzine um, for from stress records. Right. Like, oh, I got to check that out. So I sent off, you know, my three bucks for probably hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. Which is like me, you know, it's like the greeting album. <laughs> and then I got them all. But anyway, what was so great, was not only were the, were the songs and this, you know, incredible, interesting voice really captivating my mind because it was about two things. It was about unrequited love, yep. great theme. And he was writing really honestly about his own struggles with his mental illness. Yeah. And it was very, very autobiographical. So you feel, you felt, I felt like I knew this guy, but then he had great humor. So he was recording his mom <laughs> she clearly did, clearly did not know this. He right. was yelling it from his basement in yep. West Virginia. And he would put it between the songs on the tapes. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, that, I, that's so cool. I, well, I love this. You know, I love the Scorsese film back then. I still love it. Uh, the mm -hmm. King of Comedy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, this guy's just like a real life <laughs> Rupert Pupkin because it's yeah. real, not fictional. And I also really love this great book from New Orleans. A Confederacy of Dunces, John Kennedy Toole, who mm -hmm. had committed suicide, wrote this book that won the Pulitzer Prize. And the mm -hmm. character, Ignatius J. Riley, had this incredible relationship with this mom, very similar to Scorsese's King of Comedy. So once again, I saw that in Daniel's life. I don't know the guy. Yeah. He's kind of mythical at this point to me. Mm -hmm. And I started keeping a file on him because all of a sudden, he certainly didn't get famous, but he became known in the underground through right. WFMU in New Jersey and Sonic Youth and a few tastemakers on the East Coast. And Yola Tango, definitely, yeah. in Hoboken. I was living in Hoboken by that, by that time. So that was the big hotbed of the music scene. It was very regional. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I started keeping a folder on him because all of a sudden this guy who I can't see play live, he doesn't tour, he's in the metal <laughs> Well, in and out, yeah. he's throwing an old lady from church out a window. Right. He's crashed dad's plane. It's just like, holy Christ. I'm just, so I kept his folder. And what I found was his story was epic yeah. in my mind. Yeah. And, but largely unknown, which was great because there's no internet, you know? Yeah. You and have, also, you'd have to be. You'd have to be reading those zines and 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 a part of that scene. And a lot of people that would be interested in this probably aren't reading those things. So well, certainly the fanzines had a small audience, but you know yeah. when he would when he would crash a plane or throw a lady out the window, he was in the Village Voice, <laughs> yeah. the New York Press, yeah. like real newspaper. Mm -hmm. So you know he was making the news, and I just kept following it. I clearly loved his songwriting and his piano playing his guitar playing i loved his records but i love his myth and story he had it all in mm -hmm. mind um he, you know people in the in, uh the gatekeeper of you know at the time which sort of been eradicated now the rolling stone magazines and the major music label and all the people the gatekeepers of who becomes popular right um you know hated this guy and the, and the old crusty screen you know the, the old crusty music writers from the sixties who just can't stop writing. I love Bob Dylan. There's no bigger fan in the beach sure. boys. I mean, I no, there's no big fan, but enough already. It's like, it's <laughs> two thousand. It's already, it was 2000. We started making that film like mm -hmm. enough. There's gotta be somebody new, mm -hmm. younger, who is new, truly the new Dylan that 
but you know, in a different way. And yeah. I felt it was da- it was Daniel. Yeah. Um, so once again, to answer your question, you know, story is everything. If you're a filmmaker, documentary filmmakers, nonfiction filmmakers listening, it's like, you're wasting your time going to film school. You can learn camera, learn editing, mm-hmm. learn sound recording. Uh, you know, you can do that. Yeah. But you should go to story. You go to story school, man. You got to read books. You got to. Yeah. You got to study story. You got to read articles. You got to understand storytelling. Right. And then, you know, anyone can make a great shot. Sure. Anybody can record sound editing. You got to like take those ideas from novels and all kinds of places and yep. make something unique and interesting. And that's kind of where my head was at. Well, especially, you know, and you're doing that before YouTube's a thing and you're doing that before it's, you know, any, anymore. Like the important part is not how do I learn how to make a film? Because yeah, although that's important and you're up against, you know, a slew of independent filmmakers that even more so now where you've got the internet and, and you've got YouTube out there, but you're, you're also able to learn how to do those things. I, I mean, our little setup down here, which is nothing to speak of, but it's all learned from just YouTube, (laughs) you know, and just like, well, how do I set this thing up? Okay. Well, it it tells you, but you didn't have access to that. So you're kind of more trial and error at that point in time. But today you, you can't, although you could get on and find like a a class or like some sort of a, a discussion about, um, you know, storytelling, but you've got to, you've got to really work on that piece. Um, so yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate that answer a lot. Um, this film, so, so you, when you made this film, you were, you had already, from what it sounds like, what you just said was you had already kind of heard some of the big stories that were documented here right so you know the the plane crash and the lady out the window and all that had already happened when you started making this so you have to go in after the fact and basically ask everyone to relive these things um tell them you know direct them how to tell this story and you know and and make it into a a feature film the way that you did or a a film that you that you did clearly so so you're dealing with uh a subject that's been struggling a lot with mental health right in in a time where mental health wasn't as touted and as you know uh spoken about as it is maybe now so there had to be I would imagine, I don't mean to speak for you, but I would imagine there had to be some struggles because you worked directly with Daniel for this film, right? And and just by yeah. the videos that you put into this film and the and the interactions with people with Daniel himself, you know, did you find was that kind of challenging at times? I, I would imagine. Well, the whole thing was challenging because sure. you know. The, the the key the key to telling that story, which was a true story and needed to be told, was I had deep empathy for mm-hmm. his struggles with mental health. Um, it's not exploitive in any way. I, I no. just I, it's, it's a horrible story, and what his family and friends went through because of it mm-hmm. was a big theme of the film. I mean, that's why it's the devil and Daniel Johnson. Devil's a metaphor for his mental health. It's yep. also the devil because he's is from a right wing Christian family, Church of Christ. Mm-hmm. The devil is very real to this him and his family. So that, you know, to me, it's a metaphor. Maybe it's not to him, right. but it is. If anyone's watching the film, I think it comes through pretty clearly that that's what I was doing. Yep. Um, but yeah, it was very difficult because I, you know, Daniel, as, as you learn through the people who were even closer to him than me, I mean, though I spent some years with the man and we were friends. Mm-hmm. Nobody gets that close to Daniel. I mean, in his own headspace, he thinks he's you know, he right. He's he's a pain in the ass, <laughs> and every that he's a really difficult person. Yeah, but he also he's brilliant. He's yeah. the hardest person in the room at all times. Mm-hmm. But he also is a self saboteur, mm. and that's just how it goes. I mean, you know, like uh, what Herzog said, you know, as nonfiction documentary filmmakers when we go into a place in this case waller his family and mm-hmm. the subject 
or whether you're going to um, a location somewhere in South America or Africa or wherever to get a story. Yeah. You know, we're thieves. We're stealing this stuff so we can somehow find a truth. Now, what Herzog calls it, which I really agree with, is is the ecstatic truth. That's larger than the truth. Like right. That's what I think is what we're really going for here. And I was just on this trip. I Yes, I knew the story like the back of my hand. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a screenplay to figure out the three acts of what it would be. But it, it's still told by all these real people. Right. And, you know, that's the challenge. And that's the fun. It's like fun is really what it is more than the challenge. It's yeah. Both. But this is the sandbox I play in. And that's a and that's what I'm really happy. And I spent four and a half years in that sandbox. Yeah. And it, it like it's a meticulously made, handmade film made out of largely a lot of, you know, at the time you wouldn't see, you know, Super 8 and crappy home videos. Right. I didn't shoot that stuff, but I got it from everyone all over the world that filmed Daniel. He was so interesting. People would point cameras at him. Yeah. Plus he's he's self-documenting and taping himself all the time. That's like a so gold mine. Sorry? That's like a gold Sorry. mine. You you like you have so much stuff to work with. And you know, I, I feel like, you know, that that was another question that I had for you is when when you're dealing with someone that's self document and I I'm sorry if I cut you off. Well, um and you know, you've got someone who's got what I would only imagine is mountains of of cassette tapes and, you know, drawings and uh and, you know, both of him just speaking and him singing music or he, him playing piano or whatever it may be, that had to be an arduous task to try to go through all that. I mean, hopefully you had a team to kind of help you. Maybe did, did no, just you. No. And, no, and I, it was, it's me making the film with my producer, Henry Rosenthal mm -hmm. and my editor. And I'm responsible back then, you know, we couldn't do digital transcriptions, which I do now in my new films. Uh-huh. Uh, which, you know, only helps a little bit. Yep. What I would do is sit with headphones and transcribe everything myself personally. Oh, my god! And if I found something that I thought was had big merit, I would use the star system. I was like, oh, that's a five-star bit. Oh, mm -hmm. that's three stars. Oh, that's no good. And I would figure out how I was going to work the film. That's why the film has this internal monologue with those cassette tapes. Yeah. That's me finding that material. Are the images? Yeah, it, was a, it was a mountain of stuff. It was the largest archive, to my knowledge at the time, ever found on a subject like this. Wow. It was, it was multimedia. I mean, you can't imagine thousands of photos. I mean, right. Super 8 movies. We didn't know he made Super 8 films, but those films are hugely important in the creation of this film. Yeah. So I would, I would re edit his Super 8, which, of course, were silent films i would make mm -hmm. new films out of them largely you know and just yeah. re-edit them on theme or whatever i was doing yeah. um that's a flip books game animation i mean it, it, this guy had we didn't know he had all this stuff you know yeah. i knew about some of it but certainly i didn't know we found a box a shoe box of super eight millimeter home movies which once again, not there was home movies like yeah. family stuff, yep. which are great, and I use them. But more important, he made films. This guy, comedy films, yeah, and they were brilliantly directed. And he's acting in the films. He's like Peter Sellers, yeah. He's acting himself and his mom in drag. So and he's good. He's, and the guy's a mastermind. So he was a great filmmaker too. I love so that, that part of the film where a, he, find that stuff was like, and it was it was being it looks like snowflakes. Uh huh. It's because it was being eaten by mold from a oh, damp wow. We rescued this stuff. And the same thing that went on with the with a lot of the art and the cassettes, they were in hefty bags underneath the lawnmower and the oil cans in the garage. Oh, and they were my God. Now, the family didn't know at the time how valuable this stuff is. Now it's in museums. Right. I'm not mm -hmm. making it up. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, nobody – Nobody was interested in Dan. No one took him seriously. Nobody thought he was a great artist or a great musician. Back right. No. To, to them, maybe he was just this weirdo who, you know, but you're like, no, that's not, that's not weird. Well, I mean, some people may consider that a little bit strange, but you know, that's, that's somebody who's dealing with their own devils, uh, no pun intended, and who has found a creative way to let those things out and uh, to, you know, communicate those to himself and to the world and to his family. And, and, you know, that to me, you know, 
the the wild conflict in this film that was so compelling to me was the story of a genius, right? Whose main antagonist or villain was his own brain and inside his own head. So it was causing him a lot of problems, but to the, the, the conflict there is that we saw in this film was to stifle that villain quote unquote with medicine or whatever it may be. It actually would stifle Daniel's art as well. So capturing that you, you did that so well, you know, to, to capture his lows, it, it's such a it's such a dynamic piece because his lows were also his artistic highs, you know, and awesome. Awesome. Yeah. at least at least that's the the way I perceived it, and mm-hmm. you know, so it, I think that's why it was so interesting to me because when you talk about the hero's journey and the the you know the the what a you know, if you were to to tell AI to create, you know, a perfect story, it's chances are it's going to follow the the normal tropes and the normal, um, you know, hero's journey kind of thing where you find, you know, uh, the un the unsuspecting hero find, you know, and then there's conflict and then there's the the mentor and all this and this kind of follows that, but the villain isn't an external villain; it's an internal one, which is also in my opinion, anyway, it also served as his superpower. <laughs> the villain and the superpower are almost the same thing. It's an illness, right? It's a it's a something he's struggling with, but it also is fueling or aiding some of the the most incredible art that we've seen. You know, so I I just thought. I don't know if there's any question there or anything that you guys want to add. It's just more me, me giving my, you know, outlook on, on that piece. Um, yeah. Well, I'll make a, I'll give one comment sure. about what we were addressing a little bit earlier in fairness to the family. Mm-hmm. And I think it comes through clearly in the film, though they didn't understand this crazy art and music, this their, their son was making, their very troubled son they did appreciate that when fan letters would come in all over the world, they saved them all. They understood that people like myself and the underground all over the world did appreciate it. They did get that. And they were super supportive that he continued to make that art and get it and bring him supplies and, and let him to do what he did. He obviously can't hold a day job, this guy, except right. for that one time at McDonald's. McDonald's, yeah. He's, you know, he's McDonald's most famous employee. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the fact is, They've come, they did come around eventually once the film came out. And now they finally understand his place in the world. And the world didn't understand his place in the world at the time either. Right. But now they do. Now, now he's considered, you know, right. The way we, me and a few people thought about him as truly one of the great, certainly the greatest of his generation. Absolutely. A long shot. Um, but I'm sorry, you were, the other thing you were just discussing that I thought was interesting. Um, I was talking about the the villain uh, in his own mind. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, it's it's class. It's, you got to know the rules before you break the rules. That's sure. just how it is with story. So I, I like that you brought up Hero's Journey. I'm certainly not against it. Mm-hmm. But documentaries, classically and typically back then, mm-hmm. definitely did not adhere to no. a classic three act structure. Right. Um, and I imposed that as a challenge to myself to see if I could do that. And it was interesting for me. It was not instantaneous. It was a lot of work to get it right. Yeah. So, um, and you've got to have a pretty dynamic story to even consider being able to do that. Cause you're like, you said, you're not doing the, the PBS after school documentary here. You're wanting something that can, it's not just roll, roll the TV into the classroom and put it in front of the the kids so they can learn, you know, how bees procreate or whatever they're you're, you're wanting to show a documentary for that, that shows not just this was what the life of this person was like. You're like, no, let's tell the story of that, you know, a compelling story. So yeah, I, I think that's, you got to well, you, you started know, in the right place. So. So, many, so many classic conflicts, Man right. versus nature, man against himself, which is basically what this is. It's mm-hmm. just that the devil 
is larger than the self because right. it's it's an actual invisible antagonist. Yeah. And when I discovered that, I think the film really came together. The themes were all there staring me in the face. Yeah. But when I finally got that title and identified my antagonist, because I didn't know it initially, it was there my material that I filmed and that I found from the archive, but I didn't, you know, I'm not not omniscient by any stretch. It's just hard to figure and crack crack that story. So um, the film actually does uh, conform to a class three act structure. It's got a unique cold opening, which I from Raging Bull. Mm -hmm. um, out of that, all my films do that. I don't do a, I don't do a montage of fame, which, you know, very much offends me. Uh, there are a lot of talking heads in the film but it's a biographical film and there's no one else to tell those stories. Right. Um, people are sick of talking heads because they you, you see these documentaries now and then people think if you just shoot some talking heads and get some archive and <laughs> whack it together, you made a documentary. Right. But you know what? That's not how it works. Story is, at least what I'm doing, three acts and it's supposed to be satisfying. And I'm basically fooling you that it, it can be entertaining or as funny or as moving or as tragic as a good Hollywood movie. Right. So that's, that was my goal. So, I was, you know, but you can get a lot of story and move real fast in, in nonfiction that you can't with dialogue in a classic Hollywood screenplay. Sure. Yeah. So this film covers a lot of ground and it moves real fast. So that was fun for me. I just realized that I never clicked record on the, uh, Zencaster, but, but we already had, um, We've got it recording on my end, so it's no big deal. I've got it all. I'll, but leave, I'll leave it to you. No, we're we're all right. We're good. I've got it all on. We'll edit. Yep. Yeah. Hey, can you just go back and uh, can you repeat all that? My other, my other comment I'd like to make about story structure, because you yep. brought it up. Yeah, please. And here journey was, you know, I interviewed Daniel for about five days. Super 16 millimeter, this film is very expensive. Mm-hmm. He couldn't tell, you know, by the time I met him, he couldn't tell his own stories. He, mm. he just, he wasn't there. So I threw all that in the garbage and that was that. But what was so cool is it forced me to do something unique that I probably wouldn't have figured out. So you have to make a, a problem into a solution. Right. So when I found those, those audio diaries, I like to call them the cassettes, right? Mm -hmm. That became an internal monologue. Like I love... Woody Allen film Zelig, and there's a therapy session that the, he, he keeps coming back to. And when he's in therapy, you're getting what's in his mind and what's really going on. And then you cut away to all the Zelig stuff. And I love that film. So I basically stole that. And <laughs> no one knows that. But basically, those tapes are internal monologue, which I love. Yeah. And it it's a parallel edit situation off of the stories being told by the friends and family. Wow. So th I think that's what made the film truly unique and better and more emotional and deep. And you don't feel like you're missing Daniel, but the fact is he's not interviewed in this film. Right. You know, which is great. I love it. People are like, why didn't Daniel get interviewed in your, in your film? <laughs> and I'm like, well, he, he, he did, but it, you know, you don't use it cause it was horrible and you wouldn't be watching the film right now. If right. I made a film of Daniel's interviews. So that's that, you know? Yeah, no, that's really interesting. You got something, Bryce? Yeah. Right. Um, so as you're going through all of this footage and all this audio and everything, um, and I'm asking this story, how did you decide the opening scene? Or how well, to start the story right there? I thought it was pretty cool. I, I, you know, what I didn't know was the opening when I shot it, but it's black and white. It's shot exactly like Pennebaker and shooting Dylan, Don't Look Back on purpose. Mm, okay. We're in a theater in LA. Daniel's doing an acoustic concert. It's two cameras, me on one super 16, my DP fortune Procopio on the other it's blocked out and we're going to cover these songs. Great. But most important is that this guy, John Pokna from the art gallery did a, did a, an intro of him. And he, he's, he, when he brings Daniel on stage, he says, ladies and gentlemen, the great, Greatest singer songwriter alive today, <laughs> Daniel Johnston. Now, I thought that was awesome, and, uh -huh. I, and he believed it. It's not hyperbole. Yeah, and I believed it. I know that you know a lot of people are ripping their hair out out of the gate, but I'm doing. I'm pushing buttons out, out of the gate. Mm. I, I love 
taken these people who don't believe this, these haters who, who you know, they, uh, who knows who they liked in 1990. Right. You know, whatever. Well, it doesn't matter. We're not talking about them now. And nobody made a film about them, right? It's just, <laughs> these are ephemeral moments. But yep. it was like, we're, 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 put, we're laying down the gauntlet. This is a fight. And we're going to back this up for the next hour and 50 minutes. Yep. And we're going to prove that statement, whether you like it or not. So it's like provocative. So I love that. That's the cold open. It's really I think cool. he's doing a song called Silly Love. He's tragic, playing it, singing in that voice. Mm -hmm. well, we have titles, you know, off and running. Yeah. You know, we start that film with with slides of his babyhood and his mom and whatever. Yep. And we're off, we're, we're off and running. We got to tell this story. Yeah. 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 I thought it was really cool. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and clearly Bryce and I aren't the only ones who think that that this was a, a wonderful documentary. Um, you know, Rotten Tomatoes gave gave the film a score of 88 percent on the tomato meter and a 91 percent audience score. So when we do this show, it's pretty rare that the audience score is higher than the critic score. Um, I mean, sometimes it happens, but um I love seeing that because that just that if that doesn't point to the underground DIY scene, you know, when the audience loves it more than the critics do, uh, you know, I don't think anything else does. Um, IndieWire touted this film as the number one best music documentary of the 21st century, which is fucking awesome. I mean, this beats out big names like Amy Winehouse, Metallica, Kurt Cobain, uh, even Anvil's documentary, which we covered on our show. Um, yeah. came in number three. So I was super stoked. I'm going, all right, we got two, <laughs> we got two of the top three, uh, in, in our show, which is, which is great. Um, you know, timeout rated this film number nine on the 20th, 20 best music documentaries of all time, which can we just say, uh, how fitting it is that this film came in number nine on their, mm. on their, you know, number nine, number nine, number yeah. nine. Yeah. Um, I just thought that was, you know, I, I wonder if somebody knew and they did that on purpose, but I don't know, maybe not. Um, and then you won, correct me if I'm wrong, the the Documentary Directing Award at Sundance in 2005. So congratulations uh, post, post uh, uh, you know, however many years later. Um, but well, well, well deserved, well deserved. Um, I hope you're proud of this. You sound like you are. Uh, it was a beautiful tale of a beautiful man who was seriously struggling in a lot of ways. Um, so I do, I do hope that this is something that you uh, are are proud of. Do you think that? Oh, I'm in, I'm incredibly proud of this film. This is good. This film is is basically uh, though I got to make other films and I'm making them right now. Yeah, that film is my like my life's work. I mean, I'm not making mm -hmm. that up. I, that film I, was everything. I love that man. I think that's really cool. I, I put everything. So it's four and a half years. Yeah. To make it, mm -hmm. it's made independently. Nobody would pay for this film. So that film is a in 2000 to 2005 a million dollars on Daniel Johnson. People wow. were mocking us for doing this and laughing at us. And my my pal, the producer Henry Rosenthal. He paid for that film because he saw half Japanese mm -hmm. and we made the film together, just two pals. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, it's like, it's like going to Vegas and putting all your money on <laughs> red or black. Yeah. And it paid it off. It was a huge, gamble, huge gamble. Yeah. So we went to Sundance. Well, first of all, we got into Sundance, which was great. Yeah. You don't know you're going to win Sundance. That was great. Thank God. And then because <laughs> it won, it was a, you know, we got distribution, big distribution, theatrical. Yeah. With, for Sony Pictures Classics. Yeah. And now we sell this film all over the world. Um, but these, you know, it, it, that was 2005. It's 2023 now. And these, mm -hmm. those lists you just called out were like two weeks ago. Yeah. So the fact that it's, this just keeps happening. This film has a life of its own outside of me. Um, and the fact that young audiences mm -hmm. and just audiences just keep talking about it and passing it on and discovering it. Yep, I'm I'm, thr I'm thrilled. I mean, well, you know, that, it, that's it, just a test. Launched my, my career. Yeah, <laughs> um, in a big in a big way. Yeah, and that's so, just a testament, uh, I think, of films. You know, yeah, I, I think that's a testament of of cult fandom, um, of the underground, like we've been talking about this whole time. I, I think that's just a true testament of what you know. When when you find something, it's like it's a diamond in the rough. When you when you find something and you can display it in a way that's so respectful and so 
you know, uh, thoughtful in the way that that you did. And people people see that. People feel the passion in this. People see, uh, you know, Daniel, and they see his um, his struggles, and they they you feel for him. You root for him. You also shake your head at him uh, during this film, and and you know, especially with the rise of, uh, I guess, it's probably not the rise of, but the rise of awareness in the mental health community. You know, I have a a bachelor's degree in psychology, so I have interest in this. So when I'm watching things like this, you know, I I'm really interested in what he was going through. Do you think that when when Daniel was kind of at, uh, so arguably he may be at the, his peak of fame right now, but um, as far as when he was at his peak of like playing music and be- getting into the the shows and having all that stuff, do you think that the general public had any idea how bad he was struggling with things, or did did they just think that he was a a quirky and fun, uh, you know? musician do you do you have any th- thoughts on that you think they understood well, you gotta remember when we're, when we're making the film there was no general public. Hmm. it's literally a very small community of geeks and freaks around the world in the underground i mean yeah. you know, it's just not any stretch of the imagination sure on its radar you just don't care hmm. and that's fine they probably never heard it and that's fine that's just not what this was um the underground was always in opposition to the commercial interests right. of the mainstream. So like, you know, in the film, for instance, I'll give you an example. You know, I come out of the underground, you know, I don't use the word alternative. I right. hate that term. <laughs> um, I come out of punk rock and underground and independence. And when, when Nirvana shows up, which is in the film, of course, and mm-hmm. Kurt Cobain, you know, it doesn't matter what I think of Kurt Cobain and his music. He's very talented. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But he's the one who loved half Japanese, loved Daniel Johnson. And he would put it in his diaries and talk about him. And mm-hmm. he wore that T-shirt. And he's the one because he literally changed the whole scene for better or worse. He's the one who put Daniel on the map. Then there was a bidding war in that mental hospital. And he gets right. signed to actually a major label record, uh, Atlantic Records, right. which was you know, insane. Right. Because he's in his and he can't record and you know he can't be in a studio and blah blah mm-hmm. blah and they made this record it's called fun i don't love that record by any stretch yeah and that didn't do very well yeah that's the end of, that's the end of act two because mm-hmm. it sold like you know two thousand copies no one mm-hmm. no one wanted that record because he didn't it was not a major label artist mm-hmm. so it was kind of like the audience was not ready at the time mm-hmm. to squint their ears past the hiss on the tapes and hear the genius of the songwriting and the themes. Right. He needed his context, which is what my job was. He needed that story told to understand what he's doing to then, hopefully, right. if you spend time with like Dylan or something like a, with a great artist and really listen to the songs, you're going to get a big reward. But it's it's not something you just like click and hear a song or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, it like any great artist. I don't care who it is. Velvet Underground. Yep. It's a deep, deep well. And if you go on the deep dive. That's where the rewards come as an audience, as a listener. And that's that's what I do. I, you right. know, everybody nowadays, unfortunately, has Wikipedia knowledge. They know a little bit about everything. But yep. you know what? I don't, I know a lot about a couple things. Hmm. And one of the things I knew a lot about was Daniel Johnston. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. And and you – so you said it took about four years to make this film. Did you, did you get pretty close, like – you you mentioned earlier you you don't nobody really gets that close to Daniel Johnston. Um, did did you consider did he consider you? Uh, do you consider him to have been one of your friends? Is that a is it, did you guys get close enough that that was a a uh, you know did you guys have a pretty close relationship? You know all things considered, we were friends. I yeah. mean, we became friends. Like uh, you know, what I learned quickly was that. Everyone who was a fan of Daniel, when they met him initially, you know, you think he's Casper the Friendly Ghost. Mm-hmm. He wrote that song. He wrote like four songs about Casper. Mm-hmm. Casper the Holy Ghost. I know Casper personally. You know, Casper's a big theme for him. You know, right. like the white ghost, the white knight that's mm-hmm. going to save the world from Satan. 
And um, you want to hug Casper and give him a hug, but Casper doesn't really hug you back. Right. But what was cool for me was spending, I spent, I mean, my God, huge amounts of time with Daniel. We were living in his town with his family for months on end, right. filming all that. Hey, was that he is the ultimate music geek obsessive like on things that he loves or king like he's an expert on mm-hmm. the film king kong and the cinema of it mm-hmm. he's an expert on the beatles like to a level you can't imagine you know he's this guy owns every beatles album in triplicate he owns every beatles solo album he owns every beatles bootleg album wow and he knows about, he loves the ruddles he loves everything yeah like me there's certain acts I don't love, mm-hmm. and most of my music geek friends are that way. We don't love everything. Not Daniel. He's got no filters. He loves everything. <laughs> this guy. He's not going to tell you like Journey sucks or whatever, or right. Kansas or whatever. It's not, he's not going to do that. Not Daniel. Yeah. Daniel loves everything. Mm-hmm. So he's got a whole <laughs> side to him. So we, you know, we would hang out and have great conversations, you know, about yeah. King Kong or the Beatles or things that he's really, you know, World War. To yeah. the, the stuff that he's an expert on, right. but then you know he, he would drink. You know he had diabetes, so he would drink so much sugar you can't imagine. They would the family would lock the cabinet up with locks and chains to keep him out of the sugar, but right. he'd find it anyway. But we would go to this Mexican restaurant. He'd order this giant tea, and we'd be having a great conversation with the crew and just bullshitting at the table and then all of a sudden daniel would take the entire diner sugar dispenser unscrew the silver top pour the entire oh my sugar god into this giant tea and he would gulp it <laughs> and then oh the sugar would and then boom his head would hit the table and he'd be conked out oh. for the rest of the meal and then 20 minutes later whoop, he wakes up and we have the conversation again wow so yeah it was, it was very difficult to work with him but he was very generous he wanted to record you know whenever we wanted to do songs he would love to do that yeah or make art he would love to do that he just couldn't be interviewed you know right as yeah. we, we already addressed that yep um good yeah uh one thing i like about the film is that um it matches the same kind of energy as daniel's songs where his songs are just very raw and like mm-hmm. here it is here's what i'm feeling I feel like you get the sense of that in the in the movie, like you're there, you're one of these characters beside Daniel watching him do all these things. Yeah. Um, so it feels like you're you're very close into what Daniel's doing and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I, I, I I agree. Probably largely due to how much self documentation carries the film, I would imagine. That's about why you're getting that feeling. Yeah. So Did, that's, that's were the cool. Were the uh, were the cassette tapes that we so you like zoomed in on the cassette tapes? Were those the actual cassette tapes? Oh yeah, the the little drawings on them and everything, and Hi Daniel and and all that. That was all the oh, actual. Yeah. Uh, so cool. everything's actual. Everything's real. I love that. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, you got you got something else, Bryce or or, um, yeah. Uh, so your first film was half Japanese, um, and then. Uh, Jad worked with Daniel on It's Spooky, uh, which they recorded in a week. Um, which is part of The Devil and Daniel Johnson. Yeah, so yeah. Uh-huh. Actually said, yeah. Um, um, I guess. In half Japanese, by the way, this is important. In half Japanese, Jad covers a Daniel Johnson song, oh. Tear Stupid Tear. So Daniel's in that film with his music. And then later, of course, I bring Jad and David Fair right. from Half Japanese. Mm-hmm as like a recurring character. Cause I love those guys. And they're so funny mm, yeah. um, into the devil and Daniel Johnson. Cause they're very much a part of the story in the movie of Daniel. There's no doubt about that. They needed to be in the film. Yeah. And, um, and they're great. Those guys are great. Yeah. No, I, and I think it was so cool in the movie when they were working together. Um, it's like, who's the lead man in this? <laughs> right. Yeah. But <laughs> it, it was really cool. Are you talking about the movie that they're making uh, my dinner with Daniel? Or are you talking about the music? <laughs> Well, I think I think Daniel was the lead man in the movie for sure. I think he kind of uh, took took care of that. Well, he, well, he hijacked the movie. They were making a, an indie film like My Dinner with Andre. These yeah. guys with a, a very lo-fi early video recorder, and then Daniel took over because, as we learned earlier, when he was young, Daniel was, of course, a great filmmaker director in the Super Eights. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, this new technology hits, 
David Fair shows up with a video camera. They're making this film, and then in, in the film, in, in, in The Devil and Dan Johnson, mm -hmm. Daniel hijacks and starts directing, yeah. which is awesome, you know, because that's <laughs> Daniel. You know, he's not, you know, Dan, Daniel has to direct. He's always in charge, right? Right. So yeah. I think that's a great scene in the film. It obviously uh, has a tragic ending. We won't ruin it for your uh, podcast listeners, but it starts off kind of great, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Sadly, uh, Daniel Johnson did die on September 11th in 2019 uh, at his home in Waller, Texas, where he was living at the end of this documentary. Were, were his Are his parents still around? Did he outlast his parents? I didn't find that anywhere. Do we know? Um, I think his... No, I know. Of course I know. Yeah. So yeah. what happened was they were obviously, as you can see in the film, even when I filmed them, really old. Elderly, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was the baby in the family. He had a lot of brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Um I believe the mom passed first. Okay. Um, and then the dad passed. So Daniel, I did. Daniel did end up outliving them, which okay. was not unexpected. Right? No, no. Uh, and then his brother, uh, you know, basically became his caretaker and manager. Okay. And he still he still manages and deals with the Daniel Johnston estate and music and art. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, so I read a clip from the Austin American Statesman about Daniel's funeral. Uh, were you able to be there? I'm just curious. I was not at the funeral. My, my friends were there yeah. who were part of the film. I wasn't able to be there. I, I actually went – I'm not big on funerals. So I yeah, did honor is, Daniel in a big, yeah. big way. Mm -hmm. I actually went to Austin the night after he died. They did. I went to San Francisco and Austin, two flights. Mm -hmm. We showed the devil and Daniel Johnson to the fans who were mourning. Oh, and did wow. Q and A, and that was the way me and my my pal Henry Rosenthal, the producer, wanted to honor Dan. And um, oh, that's really that cool. Day. That's really cool. Um, I did read that there was about a hundred uh, mourners there, including uh, David Thornberry, Kathy McCarthy, uh, Brian Beatty, Beatty um, and Jeff Tar uh, Tartikoff, and uh, and. Uh, they spoke of the theme of love and hope that runs through all of Daniel's music, which, you know, to, to boil down to the best of, you know, I'm not an expert by any means, but to kind of boil down what, what I got from Daniel's music and his message, it was all about love and hope. I mean, every song almost that, that you showed on, on this documentary was about love in one way or another. Um, maybe not every one of them, but, but that was the, the ongoing theme that, I, that I picked up on and, you know, and hope. So yeah, he deals with his devils, the devil, but you know, he had so much hope and, you know, a lot of these musicians at his funeral did actually play covers of his songs, uh, at, at one of the, at the reception. Um, what, I, this might not be a fair question, but what do you feel like is one of, if not the most memorable thing that you take with you from the film, the four filming years of this film and the people that were involved in your relationship with Daniel and everything? Is there something that stands out as like, and maybe again, maybe it's not a fair question. And, and if you don't have an answer to it, that's okay. But is there something that stands out to you as being, one of, if not the most memorable parts of it for you. Yeah, there, there actually is. Okay, good. Um, you know, we, we basically spent four years together, four and a half years making the thing, but in, you know, back and forth to Texas. Yeah. And I was living in LA and, you know, different junkets, different trips. I would edit and shoot, edit, shoot. That's how I worked. Mm -hmm. But toward the end of the shoot, see, Daniel stays up every night in that garage that you see in the film in Waller. I mean, that's his studio. It's a garage mm -hmm. turned into an art music studio. He sleeps all day. So, you know, he would stay up, like he's drawing and writing songs every single night. Nobody worked harder. Nobody wow. made more art than this guy. So I would be in this garage with him and my Bolex, my super 60 millimeter Bolex, mm -hmm. you know, after the crew had wrapped and he'd be spinning the ruddles. Now, mm -hmm. I never really appreciated the Ruddles the way he did. But when I heard it through Daniel, I was like, man, yeah, the Ruddles really are as great as the Beatles. So anyway, so yeah. one night he's spinning the Ruddles and I was filming, you know, all the little 
smiley faces and monsters and Draculas and Frankensteins and uh-huh. all the stuff. That, that, that garage is just filled with this stuff. And he knows where every little thing is. So I was just filming it. It's like three in the morning and he's playing uh, Ruddles. It's fantastic. There's a song called Number One. You know, it sounds like the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And then Daniel got up and I decided to film him, just me and Daniel and my Bolex. It's the very last scene of the film. It's the title sequence at the end. Mm. And Daniel does an interpretive dance of his entire life. Wow. And as I'm filming at three in the morning, alone in this garage, the beat, the ruddles blasting, and Daniel's doing these different dances. He's doing mm. the, the helicopter dance, like the plane crash. Yep. He's doing the Jackie Gleason for his comedy. Yep. He's doing kind of the, the devil dance. He's doing all these different interpretive yeah. dances. And I'm yelling at him like go deal go 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 i got my bolex it's all Mm -hmm. silent and that i knew when i was filming it like i'm in the eyepiece with daniel like out of the whole four years i was like this is the greatest piece of film i've ever shot i knew it i walked out of that garage 3 30 in the morning and henry was there i was like that was the greatest thing i will ever film nothing will ever be better every it was his gift yeah And and it ended up in you know when i edited it edited it together for that sequence at the end it's like it just knocks you on your ass it's like a summation of the entire movie in like a minute and a half yeah and and to this day like you know i love a lot of the stuff i keep shooting but man i'm not sure i'm ever gonna have a better night on earth with a camera what a what a powerful way to yeah, what a powerful way to wrap up your your film too. I mean, the credits rolling and him dancing as Casper, that's beautiful. But there's just so much emotion in the scene you just talked about. I it kind of gives me goosebumps when you're talking about it because when you're talking about it, I'm remembering in my head watching the film and seeing that and seeing, you know, just exactly what you're saying. He's showing his frustrations, you know, he's kind of holding his hands at his side and they're, they're shaking and vibrating. And he holds that for like, what felt like forever, you know, I'm going, man, there, and then he's spinning around and dancing to where he, you know, feeling maybe freedom or something. And like to, to have been there, I can only imagine that it's really meaningful to me that that was your memorable part. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, do you have anything else going on right now that you want to plug or speak about before we get let you kind of get on with your evening? <laughs> well, here's the thing. I'm interested on a, on a new feature documentary. It's a music story. It's not announced in the trades right now because I'm not allowed to announce it, but I'm very okay. much in production. I just got back from a bunch of shoots in the UK. I'm Please. super excited about it. I love the story, Good. but I can't say what it is yet. Okay. But I'm excited. I'm excited for you guys to see it when it's done. Absolutely. Um, I'm working really hard on it. I'm having a great time. I love the story. So that's what I'm doing. And hopefully it'll be, you know, a different film because I'm trying to make all these films, you know, to be as unique as possible from the previous films. So very cool. Hey, uh, Bryce, you have anything before we move on to the kind of the tail end of the show? Um, no, no, no. No, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll, keep, we'll keep going. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> Jeff, um, I wonder if you would be interested in uh, a short little game before we go. We've we've started so um, and it's OK if you don't want to do it. No, no harm at all. But so Bryce and I every pretty much every week we go to play pub trivia. OK, um, we've started putting a little secret segment at the end of each of our episodes where we uh, do a few trivia questions about the uh, content and obviously you you're gonna have a much uh, a, a hand up on this one uh, probably because of your your expertise. So three questions just for fun. It'll go at the end of the the episode um, if you're willing. I'm willing. All um, right. I don't know how well to do, but let's let's give it a whirl. All right. So I put together just a couple questions. Um, nothing with too much deep diving research or anything like that. So maybe you're going to tell me, actually, Jeff, you're wrong. (laughs) And uh, this is, this is the truth, but all right. According to Daniel's wiki page, how many studio albums has Daniel released? Studio? I couldn't tell you. Okay. Studio albums? Yeah. First of all, it's a gray area because. Okay. I wondered. To me, cassettes are still studio albums. 
Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So it, it, it'd be very tough to put a number on that at this point. Um, and that's that. Yep. Also, you know, I, I don't make any bones about this. Yeah. His early, his early cassette albums are the best of his work. For sure. The, 19, the 1990 album, which is largely the soundtrack of the film and where songs like True Love Will Find You in the End came from, Something's Us a Long Time. Mm -hmm. Those, that's from the 1990 album produced by my friend Kramer. It's a masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, Daniel isn't writing songs to the level that I loved for a lot of other albums that he continued making albums. Right. And I'm the biggest Daniel Jonathan. I know it doesn't mean I love everything he did. Sure. But, you know, most artists, like, you know, basically fall off a cliff. Uh -huh. Daniel's not a he kept creating, yep. but the, the songs went down. Like Artistic Vice has a couple great songs, yeah. And then the other albums, I'm not that I'm not as interested in them, sure. Just to be, you know, to be honest. The you but mean, I could the newer ones, right? you mean like the the stuff from like 2001 to 2012. Is that what you mean? That you're yeah. not as in, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not bad. It's just they're not right. It's not classic Coke, you know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, those are you know if if you go for your listeners, if you really want to go on the trip, mm -hmm. the real trip. You got to go to Songs of Pain, yep. More Songs of Pain, Hi, How Are You, Yip Jump Music, um, Respect, yep. uh, The What of Whom, uh, Live at South by Southwest, all the stress cassettes. That's uh -huh. where you want to go. And then into 1990. That's the trip. Okay. So Wikipedia does say that there's 21 albums which start with Songs of Pain and go all the way through Space Ducks. So um, maybe that's, that's closer to reality than... Um, maybe studio albums probably isn't a, a good good word, but yeah, songs of pain. Don't be scared. Uh, the what of whom? More songs of pain. Yip jump music. Hi, how are you? Retired boxer. Respect. Continued stories. Continued story with Texas instruments. Merry Christmas. It's spooky with Jad Fair. Uh, nineteen ninety artistic it's vice. Spooky. Fun. It's spooky's a masterpiece. Yeah. Yep. Like on every level. And so is Merry Christmas is fantastic. All that once again, that's a stress cassette. Yeah. Yep. Um, then after artistic vice is fun, rejected unknown, the lucky sperms, somewhat humorous with Jad Fair. Uh, fear yourself, lost and found, is and always was, beam me up with beam, and then space ducks. Uh, sound pretty fairly accurate from Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Question number two what would you guess is the most played Daniel Johnston song on Spotify? There's no way to know for sure what the most played is because not everything's digital and whatnot, but on Spotify, I can find those numbers. What do you, well, it's, well, it's from the devil and Daniel Johnston. It's either, it's probably true love will find in the end. And if it's not, it's something's last a long time, which the lyrics are written by Jad. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. The very first, uh, the the top most played song is "True Love Will Find You in the End" with twenty six million seven hundred sixty five thousand seven hundred ten plays on Spotify alone. And then some things. Number three has to, number three has to be "Devil Town." Uh, not on Spotify. What? Walking the cow. Okay. Oh, well, walking the cow is a great, great song. Yep. Um. Yep. Those are the top three. Some things last a long time have 9,890,180 plays on Spotify. Um, okay. Well, who could have who could have predicted that? Right. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, which of these bands have never covered a Daniel Johnston song from what I could find? Uh, Bright Eyes, The Flaming Lips, Nirvana, Lana Del Rey. Nirvana never covered Daniel. Very good. Yep. Bright Eyes did. Uh, they did Devil Town. Sparkle Horse and the Flaming Lips did Go. And Lana Del Rey did Some Things Last a Long Time. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, I can't even begin to tell you, man, how much of a pleasure it was to meet you and to hang out uh, this evening. I... I hope maybe someday you'll come back. So I'm really interested. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know this existed, but um, the real Rocky. I'm really interested in that one. I love uh, boxing. I love that that story. I love the Rocky movies. Um, I grew up loving those. Um, so maybe if you're interested, if you had a good time, we'll talk later, but uh, we'll have you back on to, to do another another. Um, 
documentary insight after one of those. So thank you so much for being here tonight, man. This has been amazing. It's awesome. <laughs> thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. Um, I'd be more than happy to, after you see the real Rocky, to do another episode. It's all good. Awesome. And um, I do appreciate how much you guys uh, enjoyed the film. Oh, absolutely. It was very wonderful and very wonderful to talk to you. Um, if people want to find your stuff, uh, where can they find you? Find me or the films? Yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> Not that hard to find. You Google me up. Okay. You know, you could probably find an email, but um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Okay. Uh, and the films are all out there. If you Google them up, uh, you know, author of the JT, the Roy story, certainly on Amazon Prime. Devil is everywhere. Real Rocky is on Amazon Prime if you find it under the SPN 30 for 30 series. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Judge presents Tales from a Tour Bus. You can find that on Amazon Prime as well. Cool. Maybe other places like the, that's animated music docs. Okay. That I, that I work. Um, Half Jap is on um, Half Japanese. The band that would be King is tough to find, but believe it or not, it's on Vimeo. So okay. you could find that on Vimeo. And then The Dude is a short film about the real dude from the big lebowski, the big lebowski is yeah. also on vimeo that's on vimeo you can get that one there Very so that's cool. how you find this film yeah. awesome well thanks so much jeff uh, i want to thank everybody for listening this evening to documentary insider uh, we have been jeff kalaski bryce necker and jeff fjorzig am i saying that am i pronouncing that correctly fjorzig you pronounced it perfectly awesome. thank you uh we hope you keep your minds open and be kind to each other and we will see you on the next episode of Documentary. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night, guys. Peace. Thank you again. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Alfred Neverez was a member of which 1990s boy band? Was it Boys to Men, Surface, London Beat, or All for One? Also, I don't know the answers, but we ha I'll have to like push the thing. It's a like BuzzFeed quiz okay. or something. Oh, man. Gosh. Alfred Neverez. Boys to Men, Surface, London Beat, or All 4-1? I've never heard of London Beat or Surface. Me neither. I'm going to go All for One. Yeah, let's go All for okay. One. That's correct. Yeah! yeah! I knew it wasn't Boys to Men. <laughs> all, all for One's the only one I've ever heard of other than that. Who hit number one in 1992 with I'll Be There? Uh, Mariah Carey. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I didn't even have to give you the... <laughs> I'll only give you the the uh, options if you don't know it. Okay. How many members were there in 1990s boy band 98 Degrees? Ooh. So we got Nick Latchy. Nick Latchy with the terrible <laughs> sun tattoo. Right. Then there was somebody named Drew. Okay. Um. There was the the one that I can see in my head, but I don't know his name. Okay. I think there was four. So it's four, three, six, or five. It I think it's four. Okay. You're right. It's yeah. four. I How had a poster of them on my wall. <laughs> 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 they were dressed as firefighters. In How many members were in the band? <laughs> tell, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> How many members were in the band, the R and B band surface? I don't know who that is. Three. The answer's three. Okay. Prince had a number one hit in 1991 with which color? Which color? Raspberry? Cream, no. white, purple. purple, or red? <laughs> Raspberry. That it's was... cream. No way. Yeah, it's cream. Oh, because it's the year. 1991. Yeah. Mm. That's way later. That's way later. Who had a 1990s hit with Release Me and Hold Ooh, On? Got it. Wilson Phillips. Yeah, bullseye. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Who sang the hit song Unbreak My Heart? Ooh, I got this one too. Tony Braxton. You got it. We're going to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Crisscross had a number one hit with which song in 92? Jump. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> which band had a one hit? Which band had a one hit wonder in 98 with You Get What You Give? You Get What You Give. I might need the okay. the guesses on Blink One Eighty Two. No, far from a one hit one. Right. Two princes. Oh. New okay. radicals. Okay. Or Aqua. Okay, it has to be new radicals, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> because I was going to say two princes is that's not right. I or know. 
two princes? Is that what you said? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I know Aqua's got another hit. So yeah. right. That's that's okay. yeah. Aqua. Who, I knew. Who sang "Genie in a Bottle"? Christina Aguilera. That's yeah. Christina Aguilera. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna um, try and let's give do something. one more. I could, I could picture it in my in my head. <laughs> Cher had a UK number one hit with which song in 1998? Um, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's it called though? Believe. Believe. Yeah. <laughs> this says here. It says you're awesome. <laughs> yeah, oh. we are. Thanks everybody for listening to the, to a documentary after hours. Ew, I just made weird. that up. <laughs> documentary after dark. After You're listening dark. to documentary after hours. Where we'll listen to Prince's hit song. Delilah. Cream. Creamberry beret. <laughs> Cream purple beret. All right. Bye, bitches. Goodbye, bitch. <laughs>